share some stories and we very much want to hear from you um, questions uh, and to have a conversation. But we're going to start this morning with Lucy Kung, a research fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, who did an excellent piece of work last year called Going Digital. And if you haven't yet read it, I thoroughly recommend that you do. It has some incredibly practical ideas and some good challenging ideas as well to, to get moving some of those people who may be a little more resistant to change, shall we say, in your organisations. So to start with, Lucy is going to take us through some of the key findings um, and then we will have a bit of a discussion and interactive um, debate around some of those issues and what we've been doing about them. Great. So Lucy, over to you. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, hang on, how do you get this full screen? Yeah. Okay, terrific. Yeah, so this is a big piece of research I published in November. And the idea behind this research is essentially there's two simultaneous transformations happening in the media right now. One is in terms of content. And I have absolutely no doubt that the media journalism profession with a deep commitment to great content and serving audiences will master that transformation. But it became incredibly clear there is an additional transformation, a parallel transformation that needs to happen in organizations in order to make sure that those organizations pro <coughs> producing journalism stay viable, that they have a real future. And that organizational transformation, as I'm sure a lot of you have experienced, is very painful. Um, and what I try to do with this work is look at what is best practice in terms of how organizations are changing. So that was a very big piece of research, 70 interviews, 14 companies I went into in depth. The big issue, there were two big issues that came out, and one of them was the challenge of culture change. And this is a kind of boomerang. I mean, when the internet first hit, <laughs> um, culture was an issue. It's now come back. So what I'm going to do in this first kind of six, seven minutes is give a quick overview of the key findings from this research, kind of like top line structure in where does this culture issue change hit and how are really strong organizations, legacy organizations, how are they attacking it? And then we're going to move on to my three colleagues, all of whom are leading really interesting and intriguing and successful change initiatives in terms of their organization. So I'm kind of giving a bit of architecture from a big group of organizations, then we're going to d delve in deeper. Um, Culture is really, really intrinsic to organizations. So the starting point, I think, for understanding why culture has become such an issue is to look at the nature of <coughs> legacy organizations. And in the last few years, we've got very, very seduced by Silicon Valley. Lots of management techniques have come in from Silicon Valley. We've become very, very obsessed for good reasons with the platforms. But I think it's worth looking at where legacy organizations stand. And that's a very different place from Silicon Valley software-based technology companies. And, oh, this is the report, by the way, and it's available for free. It's very short, 10,000 words, lots of bullet points, lots of citations, but it's free on the Reuters Institute website. Um, <coughs> most legacy media organizations have progressed in stages over the last 50 years or so. They all started off as mass media organizations, a relatively simple product, for mass audiences. One product fits all, portfolio product. So if you look at the 1950s, we had, they were relatively simple organizations. Technology was also relatively straightforward. Product was relatively <coughs> straightforward. In the 1980s, they added a kind of niche layer into their businesses. Newspapers at, started adding supplements, magazines. Um, broadcasters added niche channels. Nine, mid 1990s, legacy media added on website on demand levels. So their businesses are getting progressively more and more complex. And then obviously 2007, eight with the launch of Facebook, the iPhone, we added the mobile social layer. So you have organizations that have got progressively more complex. They haven't exited the layers below. The layers below are often still keeping the lights on financially. You can't get rid of them. But what that means for really long established organizations <laughs> is that then arbitraging resources, attention, investments across all of these layers. And they've got to make sure all these layers talk to each other. And they're doing that against the background of growing poor relatively fast in some cases. 
and they're competing against new players who are just dealing in one or two of these layers. So their new competitors have the luxury of focus and a lot of resources. So what does that mean? It means, yeah, as audiences, we've had a massive increase in choice, but the starting point for legacy media is very, very complex organizations, stretched resources, and a real need, and this is the real cultural shift, organizational shift, the historic strengths and assets are still focused on the legacy layer, mm -hmm. and the real challenge, the future is up at the top. And the big challenge for organizations is moving the center of gravity up. And that's where the culture pressures start to come in. And then on top of that, this transition journey is becoming a very old story. Most legacy media have been trying to make this transition for over two decades now. So this adds another layer of complexity. So essentially, most large media organizations have some degree of tech debt, unfinished major transformation projects that are still lingering, that haven't brought all the benefits they were meant to. Secondly, for the individuals leading those change processes, there is a real risk of burnout. There's an awful lot of very highly skilled people exiting the industry simply because this process of moving the center of gravity up the organization is so exhausting. And this burnout, I think, is a real issue for those driving change projects and for those working on the boundaries between the old and the new. It's relatively easy if you're just in a digital pure play, but if you're in a legacy added, trying to add a pure play layer, life is very hard. Secondly, I mean, th thirdly, this is, a, this is actually the demogorgon from those of you who saw Stranger Things series two. You know, there becomes a split in the community. Some people have seen the demogorgon and some people haven't. Those who get it really understand how weak the position of legacy media is, how they grew up in a world being dominant players and they're now minnows, they're tiny fish, if you look at the resources that the people are now competing, competing <coughs> against. And that's also very challenging for the change leaders. They understand the scale of the challenge, but not everyone's got it. And the fourth point, which I know Fiona's going to talk about, is this internal, it's very easy to get sucked into the, inter, the challenges of the internal transformation and miss the point that there's a really profound change happening in terms of markets. You can get into a kind of organizational bubble. So I think those are the kind of four issues in terms of where the organization is coming from. And those are really, those two slides kind of show what the culture change challenge is becoming. So what, what's happening in terms, oh, sorry, one other thing. Big shift in knowledge hierarchy in legacy media. The big change is that expertise is no longer automatically correlated with how long you've been in the industry. There is a situation, we have a situation now where some of the most critical knowledge in the organization is now in the newer areas of the organization, in the lower levels of the organization, at the peripheries of the organization. It's no longer the case you've been in the, in the industry 30 years, you have the best expertise. Some really critical expertise is in new places. And therefore, for leaders, you need to build a culture and a structure, and I'll come into the fact that culture is embedded in other things, that optimizes information flow. flow. It's really, really important all of this critical information and expertise is flowing around the organization. And that has really big implications for the type of culture you build in terms of openness, in terms of changing hierarchies, and so on. So I'm just going to move quickly into kind of top level of, of what is the culture change looking like. The big, the big cultural tension that seems to come up in the companies I spoke to, and some organizations are doing much better than others in terms of solving it, is the tension between technology and journalism which is a kind of no-brainer. So I tried to visualize this here. If you take this blue bubble as the culture of journalists, the occupational culture, the values that journalists as a profession share, and the orange one is the value that people coming up from tech share, they are very different. So journalists tend to have a background in the liberal arts, in words, in thoughts. Tech is more about numbers, it's about pure science, it's about engineering. So different kind of root disciplines. In terms of their focus, um, journalists are about serving audiences, protecting public values. Tech are really have an equal obsession, but it's about perfecting the product. It's about perfecting US, perfecting the experience. So it's a more kind of pragmatic focus. And journalism is, has had to be risk averse. And I mean that not in terms of brave investigative reporters. I mean this is a profession that has developed 
with technologies where you had to get things as perfect as possible before you press the publish or the broadcast button because it was too expensive, too painful to correct afterwards. Whereas in technology, you have a basis of experiment. We're all used to you know, updates in technology. It's not a problem. But what I saw in the organizations that are performing well, and this happens a lot through embedding, which I'll come up to later, is they, they get over this potential tension in the culture by working on the similarities. And what happened in... in, in um, very clear at Shipstead, very clear at Washington Post, New York Times, um, FT and so on, is that the points of commonality are both tech and journalism prize clarity of language, clarity of thought. Um, both are essentially craft professions. They want to perfect the product, for their audiences, and both have very high intrinsic motivation. People join, people enter these professions because they love the role, they love what's being created. And essentially, cultural synthesis, get it, build, uh, um, uh, dissolving the tension between, between these two cultural groups seems to work best when you, you build on these similarities. Now, just coming on to how you change culture, what was really clear is, ironically, you change culture actually not by trying to change culture. You don't launch a culture change initiative. What you do is you, change, you launch a series of programs that are integrated and that with the net goal of trying to change the overall culture. It starts with the leadership. You have to have incredibly clear messaging from the leaders of the organization. This is the problem we face. This is where we want to go. And that's really like, it's not 80-20, but that's about 60%, 50% of this whole culture change game actually relies on the leader. And that's why the people leading this stuff, their, their role is so incredibly important. After that... It's learning. It's, it's setting up a program of continuous learning inputs coming into the organization, new inputs. Because this field is, is changing very fast, there isn't a core body of knowledge that has to be acquired, and once you've got that, you're ready to go. The field is moving very fast. Um, a lot of flexibility in structures. I'll look at that in a bit later. But that's about in also ensuring that, that skills can synthesize and, and learning can move around. And then smaller issues, channels, to ensure that knowledge can flow around, and building prompts, culture change prompts, into the new systems you're putting in place. And those elements together are what create the culture change. Um, <clears throat> if we look at how that looks, what is it, some a few details here before I move on to my colleagues. In terms of leadership, communication is absolutely central. Um, and as a leader of this kind of work, you are never not communicating. You are never in a neutral communication state. Everything you do is giving a message. Um, and what I saw in the companies I spoke to was there a lot of very overt communication, so very frequent town halls, um, very smart newsletters, jokey newsletters, witty newsletters, but really stressing behavior we want, behavior we don't want, values we're after, values we're not. But also, probably equally significant, a lot of kind of implicit, uh, subcutaneous communication from leaders. So meeting choreography, if you have a meeting, what's at the top of the agenda? You move digital to the top of the agenda and you move legacy down to the bottom. Job titles, so the Washington Post took digital out of all titles because everyone is digital, trying to remove the idea that there's a then and a for. Um, and in terms of ensuring information can flow, it's really important. There is a risk with these transformations that leaders never hear if things are going off track. Because people, you know, they don't, they're checking in regularly, they get their KPIs, yes, it's fine, and then suddenly they hear a message, actually the entire X team is planning to leave because they're so frustrated. So you need to have very good mechanisms that they can connect with the other layers of the organization they don't normally get in contact with. And the, what I was finding coming up in the stronger organizations was reverse mentoring. So smart young digital people actually mentoring senior people, trying to, you know, trying to explain what's going on. And a lot of kind of informal micro events where leaders had breakfasts and suppers regularly with people they wouldn't normally come into contact with and creating a, a venue where they could honestly explain what's going on, a sort of low, low, low tense, uh, an untense environment where people could really explain what's going on. Um, and those are, these are just some comments where essentially the message from the people I spoke to is that you think everyone should know this, you think they've got this message, they really haven't. You cannot under-communicate the core change message. 
Um, in terms of learning, just a few tips of what I came across. The biggest thing in the strongest organizations, and this, this applies to some real, real industry leaders you'd think don't need to do this, very porous boundaries. Frequently, I'd go and do interviews in some, some organization. They say, oh, the Washington Post is coming in later for lunch and learn. Do you want to stay around? So lots and lots of people, um, essentially, the me legacy media are incredibly open to talking to other le legacy media firms and sharing experiences, and smart companies are taking advantage of that. Secondly, at, as I said, continuous learning inputs. And what I'm seeing was there were a lot of high-level inputs, so there are some fantastic programs, the Salzburger program at Columbia, um, executive management programs at Harvard and INSEAD and Stanford, trips to Silicon Valley, but some really interesting kind of DIY, low-cost, completely scalable learning initiatives where uh, I think Axel Springer had this brilliant thing where great investigative journalists, maybe a bit, you know, established, experienced, would do mutual learning with the video teams. They would learn how to do video, and the new people doing video for Snapchat or whatever would learn what the real ethics and challenges of proper investigative journalism. So kind of, um, uh, Vox has its own internal university. Um, a number of them have, have putting together internal, do-it-yourself learning, learning projects within the organization. And obviously, every time you do that, you're kind of shifting boundaries, you're loosening the hierarchy, you're building links between the organization. You're, and as you all know, kind of creativity, innovation, it's not to do with the, the close nodes, it's to do with the weaker ties. And what you're doing with all this is building up weaker ties with people that have valuable information. Um, embedding, really clear. The first stage in new learning is embed, is, is training, but after that, you try and embed the skills together, and then you really get synthesis. And the other thing that's very clear is you keep expectations really realistic. Not everyone has to know everything. And people will self-select. They know. I mean, I think, I think it was actually Springer found some, found some very interesting people interested, say, in video journalism. But not everyone needs to know it. Um, so that's just some quotes there. So just to close up from my part, the big shifts I see in terms of what has to happen in culture, firstly, for le legacy organizations that have been leaders, it's really important to, to let, make people understand that leadership in one era does not automatically mean you will lead in the next. And in fact, the more successful you were in one era, the lower the likelihood of transferring that leadership position because you get complacent. You know, it's, it's, it's all about the culture. If you have a culture of success in one era, it's really hard to, to dissolve that and build a new culture. The second one, which I think is, is really why this learning and, and flattening hierarchies and, and improving information flow, the, the challenge of finding a sustainable <coughs> business model for quality journalism is so profound, the odds are stacked so hugely against classic media organizations with a heritage of, of journalism. It's everyone's challenge. You cannot, you know, even great journalists cannot afford to leave this to the business people. Everyone has to be involved in finding the solution. Everyone has to be involved in making the tech work, getting more into touch with users, understand how the world is changing. And the last thing is technology is absolutely intrinsic to everything. It has gone, that's the big story in the media industry, it's gone from being the support service, the plumbing, to being intrinsic to the ability to understand audiences, intrinsic to the ability to create, to do great storytelling. And that's really, the, I think, probably the really profound shift that needs to happen. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you very Over much. To you, Jane. <laughs>Super. So we're going to go into um, so 20, 25 minutes of conversation um, between the three of us uh, with some input, I'm sure, from Lucy um, to tackle some of those things head on and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion with the group. Um, so I think we'll start off with the, the big issue of culture, um, kind of what is it, uh, what, are, what are the good things, what are the bad things. So I think just to, to, to kick off from our personal experience here, there's a lot of, that is really good in our culture. So you want to build on that rather than going for wholesale change. I remember when I turned up at Reuters, I had it drummed into me that Reuters was about speed, accuracy, and freedom from bias. And those were values that I could definitely adhere to and, mm -hmm. and, and, 
and aspire to, and, and I still do in this digital transformation. Um, and I think that's been one of the kind of key things is that, as Lucy was saying, you don't go on a culture change program, but you, you start to shift things using what's good before that you can build on. But I'm interested to hear from the both of you, kind of what in your cultures has been um, maybe less good, some behaviours or some habits maybe that have grown up that less good that you wanted to change and you've had to work on changing? Uh, well, if I, if I start, I work at the BBC, um, it's obviously a public service broadcaster, um, which is a massive global footprint. And, and the, on the good side, um, everyone that works at the BBC really believes in journalism, you know, really is committed to the work they do and are, will go the extra mile in the field, in the office anywhere in the world to make their story the best it can possibly be. And really that is what helps me um, in the change that I am trying to bring about inside the corporation. And my, my challenge was very much about audiences, which we'll get into later, um, but our need to balance the audience so that we served women, served men, served a younger audience, and served the, the less well-off, so people on lower incomes all equally. Now, on, on the flip side, the reason why I needed to have that challenge and drive that challenge is that um, the BBC has obviously been around for a long time, nearly 100 years, and over time it has, um, its, it, its default voice is perceived to be for an older, male-skewing, well-off, i.e. highly educated audience. This is in the UK I'm talking about at the moment. And, um, and, and that was a default voice, a default way of making content that permeate, you know, it permeates the building. You know, we're talking, as I said, about nearly 100 years. And with that, it, going back on Lucy's slides, you know, the BBC is huge. It has evolved. You know, it, it, de it developed digital channels, rolling news channels. Um, it has, um, you know, umpteen radio programs. It, so it keeps on layering on new forms of outlet, out, output and content um, without uh, reorganizing at the core before it adds on again. And that is, and we're in that phase again in the digital world. So when, when um, you know, online first started, the BBC website's 20 years old, they just take a team, they put them in a floor and away they go. You know, and another, so there's another team that has to be communicated with, another team that has to be organized within the vastly complex web that already exists. And um, that is not, that is very difficult to, um, to organize and reorientate towards a new content challenge, which for us, as I say, was about the female audience, the young and the less well-off. Um, and on a basic level, it came down to things like the nine o'clock meeting. Where is digital discussed within the nine o'clock meeting? How is it discussed in the nine o'clock meeting? I could go into this in great depth. I won't. You can ask me questions <laughs> later. Um, and also things like we have a, a breaking news priorities list. One of the first things when I got my job was to try and begin the conversation to redefine the breaking news priorities list so that when journalists were in the field, digital had to be driven much further up that priority list because it was it was unbelievably low down. And it was a very complex um, set of conversations, many conversations because there's so many bits of the BBC to be had to get that document redefined and reissued, which we did do, but it took a very long time, exactly because of what Lucy's saying, the layering on endlessly through an organization. Um, so that, that organizational charts and the way comms flow around a complex organization are unbelievably difficult. Um, I could bang on for an hour in itself in that, but the key to breaking that, and this will be my last point, is, is completely about um, communication and establishing webs of communication that aren't up and down, they're kind of, it's, it's all around, you know, and, and, and you know, it flows in a way that never fl has flown before, and that's what's kind of helped us get some things moving, but anyway. Let Christina reflect on so that. Let's come back to communication in a second, <coughs> but I just wanted to pick up um, on one of the points that you made about audiences, because mm. Christina, I think when, in your transformation, it's been very much based on shifting a mindset. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are, I'm not saying that we are not having challenges because we are struggling like all of you, all of us who are struggling in legacy media. Uh, but 
The mic? Can yeah. you hear me now? Okay. Uh, well, I was saying that uh, at this point, SVT, the Swedish public service broadcaster, is uh, growing digitally by 30% in a mature market. And at the same time, we're also actually gr growing a little bit in, BC, uh, in broadcast on a shrinking market. Uh, and this is a change that has come across over the last two years. Um, and, and I think that the reason for that is partly the change of culture. We have had uh, the privilege of maneuver that we could recruit new talent. And uh, this is thanks to wise policy 15 years ago, because it's very difficult to, to fire people in, in Sweden. You basically have to steal from your employer to be fired. So, so for 15 years, we've been trying to reduce this, the, the number of staff so we can recruit people. But what we found is that if we don't change the, the culture and the digital literacy of all staff, we will not be able to attract talent or, or keep them. Because if you are a 25 really brilliant developer, uh, you don't want to be banging your head towards um, TV stars that are, are not understanding what you're doing. Uh, if you can go and have fun at Spotify or Mojang or another uh, tech company. So we needed to do something about everyone. Uh, and, and we did that by having um, uh, different kinds of uh, events like lunch speeches where we brought in people from external and internal people talking about the change in society, the change in our industry, the, the challenges. So um, we had a number of different programs to do that. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that we ask the audience for help. Should we show the video? I don't think I will show the video. Maybe I should just sure. talk, yeah. explain the, the project. Uh, for the last two years, uh, we asked the audience to help us to become more relevant, to become more, um, to deliver news in the way that the audience need today. Uh, so hundreds of co-workers have been out seeing over a thousand people all over Sweden uh, in all ages, all parts of society, the kayak club in Karlskrona to a choir in the south of Sweden to schools and, and workplaces and sports associations and really asked for feedback. What can we do differently? And, and you do you think that the journalists at the beginning was very eager to go on these meetings? <laughs> Not very, because many said, you know, I, I see audience every day, I'm out there talking to people. But the thing is, we don't talk to people in the way uh, we do when we come to really listen. Because we come to see people when we do a news story, and we already have a, a picture in our head who they are. We work with stereotypes to to illustrate uh, a news story that we already have made up. So coming out without another uh, another agenda than to listen to people really, really made a difference. Uh, one of our most uh, famous news hosts. Um, award-winning, came back from one of these meetings, say, all pale, saying, do you know what, Christina? They didn't know who I was. <laughs> and that changes the way we talk in the newsroom. That changes the way we do prioritize our time. So this project has really uh, been important, among other things, of course. Yeah. Fiona, you've done yeah. a lot of work with audiences. Would you like to share with, with people some of the yes. pilots that you've done? Yes. So, um, as I say, our change um, challenge was very much instigated by the, our need to find more female audience, to reach more female audience, to reach more under 34s, and definitely to reach the, uh, the less well-off, the people under me mean incomes in Britain. So that's sort of the... The, the burning platform, the essence of you know what gets me up every day. So we have a digital um, pilot process, which I'll 
go into in greater depth, but essentially it, it is a, it's, it's part of the, our change, and it's a team of about six people, and they go and sit with a specialist team, be it the health team, be it the entertainment team. At the moment, they're with the 10 o'clock news, and they, they literally live with them for a month. Um, and the beginning of that process is all about this is the audience we want to reach. We want to reach more female audiences of any age. We want to reach the young. We want to reach the less well-off. And how are you, as experts in the kind of journalism you do, going to do that? How are you going to talk to these people? And we have a two-day away day process. Um, Lucy will get the slides up, because I, I think some people might be interested. And we take them away for two days, which is a bigger thing in itself, because how on earth do you get journalists to break away from the news cycle for two whole days or a day and a half? And um, this is just a breakdown of the health team's away day. But a key part of that um, away day is we bring a section of the audiences in, like real people, in to meet the health team, let's say, or meet the entertainment team, or meet the education team, and sit down, and they tell them what they think of BBC journalism in that area, and what matters to them, what talks to them, what they like, what they don't like, right down to the imagery, right down to the, the headline, right down to whether they ever look at it at all. And that was completely a wake-up moment for a lot of those teams. So some of these teams were not necessarily all embracing of this process that we were running with them, this digital piloting process. But when, we, when they had the R or the whatever with these audience groups, their attitudes changed because they believe in the audience, they want their journalism to reach that audience, and this was a moment where they were like, wow, this is what these people really think of my work and, and what I need, and, and this is what they want, would like to see my work do in order it to be more relevant to them. So, depends on your organization, but interestingly, again, going back to that siloed issue, marketing and audiences and organizations do tend to be off to the side, you know, you may not be best friends with your head of marketing, you may not even know who they are, you need to find out who they are and you need to make friends with them because they are a brilliant resource, they have uh, invariably have bits of budget themselves, so our marketing department has to pay to find these people to bring them in to, and that, that was, has been totally transformative for us and um, it was a new set of relationships I had to build with um, working with our marketing experts. So I really don't think you can underestimate the importance of bringing that authentic audience input to the teams you're trying to work with. Yeah. And it's been really interesting as well. I mean, from an agency point of view, obviously we have a, a consumer arm at Reuters, but the vast majority of our revenue comes from our professional clients, be it on the financial side or the media side. And last year, um, we launched a, a big project and plan to go out and visit um, and make sure that our salespeople knew the digital editors or the, the social editors at our major clients. Because um, before, when we talked about digital, the, the sense really was about the digital natives, um, the, the, the pure plays at the top of, of Lucy's chart. And, and it's really interesting. I mean, at the end of the day, journalists will be convinced by their sources. And so uh, we were able to go back in to our newsrooms and say, we have seen 66 clients and more than 50% want this sort of news. You know, 35% of them now need video to be done like this. Um, and, and no one could argue with it because these were real people who pay us very real money, many of whom are probably sitting in this room right now. Um, you know, and, and if, we're not, if we're not keeping up with the projects that, um, that our clients have been doing to know their audiences and therefore for us to know what our clients need to appeal to them, then, then we would become irrelevant. And it's become interesting to see how data, um, so even though that's mm -hmm. putting unstructured data together into some sort of structure, has been an incredibly powerful force for change. And again, it builds on the best part of the culture, which is, you know, Reuters is run by five trust principles, as you might know, the fifth of which is, is one of my favorites, um, because it says, no effort shall be spared to expand and adapt the news to maintain Reuters' place as the leading news organization in the world. And so you kind of appeal to that core loyalty, um, but, through, but through data. Um, I wanted to come back to something uh, that you mentioned, mm. Fiona, around communication. Mm. And, and I'd be interested to know 
and to discuss a little bit about how you get that messaging out. Because, again, I think that you, Lucy was saying, you, you, can, you can't over-communicate You are never change. not communicating. Um, so whatever you do, whatever, whatever you prioritise, whatever you take your attention away from is a message. But also, um, it's a kind of trope in change theory, but it's so true. You, you have to communicate 100 times more, really 100 times more than you think is necessary. You think you are so boring, how can this not still have got through? But it really hasn't got through. Because if it's a message that people at some level really don't want to hear, because there are... You know, a lot of culture change is about power change, actually, deep down. It's very, very emotional because it's, it's about a lot of people really giving away power to other people. And that's hard for all of us. And, it, you know, there's status issues. And, and actually, for senior people in the industry, it, it can get quite existential. They can begin to see, actually, I have a sell-by date as well, and I'm approaching that. And that can lead to all kinds of, you know, deep reactions that are not too positive for the organization. So that's why... You have the messaging from leaders has to work has to cut across yeah. all of those all of those very human instincts that are there. Um, this is a very emotional process, but the emotions are kind of deeper down. So, yeah. Uh, so communication, yeah. Um, I think just some observations because I don't pretend that this is a crack to this completely, but. Um, we so the, our division, mobile and online division, is two years old. It was started with new corporate funding, so it was a recognition from the top that having a mobile and online focus—it's it's around three hundred odd people—was um, corporately very important. That was that was good. So we set and there was a hot house to sort of set up the structure for it. And one of the things that came out of the staff feedback was we want more communication, which was interesting. So we started hold, holding town halls, and the first town hall we held in the biggest room in broadcasting house it was static standing room only. And I was kind of overwhelmed, thinking a lot of the people in the room weren't even from the division, which was interesting. There was a real hunger for knowledge. So as a result of that, we, we hold these um, town halls that are open to anybody uh, every six weeks, which sometimes feels, for me, feels like Groundhog Day because it's like, oh my God, I've got to say it again. Um, but every time the room is in standing overflow and every time people appear from radio, from places that aren't necessarily even connected to news. So I, I, again, I would say you can't underestimate the importance of regular communication and in that communication it's not about me banging on basically some le leaders from within the division people who've been leading original content trials and experiments get up showcase what they've done report back on what they've learned and what impact it's had on on the audience with any data they have on it and they share that and people get real value from that and a lot of the younger people who don't necessarily have a voice or have power or you know are finding their way, they think that's a great access point for them because it shows them who, who other people are in the organization that they might go and talk to, what other projects are going on that they could maybe go and align with. Um, so it, that has been really, really effective. And it's also been very good for showcasing new young uh, leaders who are doing things. So it's giving them a voice and giving them practice at standing up and showcasing their work. In alignment with that, we sort of do a, a fortnightly newsletter on some of the best content examples. It's another thing that's been interesting. So again, people who are far away, so in the regions or around the world, read that. So it's another access point for them. Um, and at these, so these uh, digital pilot away days, so now 100 and, 100 and nearly 140 people have been through this process. But as part of that, again, that that sort of cadre of you know, leaders or content um, experimenters come to that and present and talk. So it's all about trying to increase accessibility to people to share ideas that aren't, and it's not in a top-down process where the boss stands up and says that it's the people who are actually doing it get to talk about people who want to learn more about it. Uh, but there's a lot of work involved in creating the staff time and space so they can meet to do this and um, giving people the time to do it. And that cannot be 
underestimated because again you, if you, you know we'll get into this if people become overloaded because they're having to deliver too much they get burnt out and tired so yeah. it's really interesting though isn't it because you, you mentioned emails we, we mm. were having a laugh um the other day because um one of we were having a laugh in the office the other day because one of the emails that i had sent out um i was given the open rate and it was 10 percent and um and uh, my colleagues from PR were like, amazing, you got 10%. Mm. And I was like, I was so depressed, 10% only. Um, but it was interesting because I, I've been sending out literally weekly emails um, for the first two years. And each one was just titled multimedia colon and then something that I tried to make catchy, but clearly only got 10% out of reach. Um, and, and it was interesting because that was just like a drum beat. So even the most hardened, change-resistant, I'm a financial journalist, this has nothing to do with me, um, reporters in the field knew of every Monday, or maybe Tuesday if I was a bit late, um, they would get something that would say multimedia and that it was important and that it was ongoing and it was not going to go away and it was not a fad and this is actually the way that we need to do things. Um, and, and, and I think one of the things I learned through that was consistency mm. you know that you, when you're leading huge change you, you can't communicate too much you know constantly consistently mm. it's hard you know, people need to know where they're going um, in these things and when you're trying to get different voices which I, I mm. think we've we've all been doing it's been fascinating to me over the last few months actually just to see how some of the leaders who are maybe the hardest people to bring around because as Lucy says they were kind of thinking hang on a second this is um, existentially worrying for me, um, have now really got on board, but in their own words, um, which is fantastic, because I don't want people to read out my script, because otherwise everyone will know it's just Jane's script. Um, but we had, you know, for example, the main news editor in um, Europe, Middle East and Africa last week sent out his weekly note, which I couldn't have written better. I mean, it was just awesome. It was, I literally went up to him when it landed, I said, you know, that's it, my job here is done, I'm off. Because um, he, was, he was owning the message. Or, you know, our editor-in-chief, you know, fantastic journalist and really into the journalism. When he writes an email praising digital-friendly journalism, everyone else starts to move. You know, it's, it's like the power of using the different voices for the right reasons. You know, that person has the voice on, on that, that person, you know, on praise, that person has the right, the right voice for process, that, that person has the right voice for collaboration, whatever. And that's been really, really powerful just to harness each mm. person's character. And I think that's really is the key to success because you need to be able to combine those uh, competencies. You need the, the, the experienced reporter and their knowledge, and you need the young uh, technicians or the, the people bringing in new, new understanding about the media. Uh, and, and to be able to do that, you need to, to, to make them feel safe in talking to each other. Yeah. And you do that by constantly raising the, the understanding. For instance, I mean, with consistency, we have um, a competence blog where we update daily, for instance, and, and that makes people going from um, before uh, the traditional television uh, journalist could view these young people coming in, you didn't understand their lingo, you thought, saw them as a threat to mm -hmm. your job, and you have been here for 20 years and you know how things are done. So in this way, when you get to feel a bit more more yeah. oriented, you are not threatened, and yeah. you can. Call. And the other way around, also, you need to to find the respect um, from from all parts to work well together. Yeah. I think. Well, and that takes us on to the other topic that we were discussing a lot um, before coming to Perugia around training. Um, and as Lucy was saying. Uh, <coughs> You, you can do the top-down training, we're gonna teach you how to do this, but actually so much of digital is having to be bottom-up. So I love your idea of like the investigative journalist sitting with the Snap team, you know, working out how to, what, why a Snapchat story? Um, uh, but let, let's just quickly, maybe like, let's make this the last part of the formal part and then we can open it up for, for discussion. But what are some of the examples that you've seen really work of 
of peer-to-peer -peer training or skills increase or as, as, uh, as Lucy was saying, kind of that information flow? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, uh, it's, it's a matter of volume. I mean, we mm. used to send a few really enthusiastic uh, journalists to classes in Geneva and then they, and expect them to come back and change the newsroom. Uh, and, and it doesn't work that way. The risk of burnout and frustration is, is really, really big. So now we, we try to bring in uh, people that can teach a larger group so we get uh, like a wave of new knowledge into the newsroom and that can make a, ch a change. And people can support each other in, in changing the way we work. Um, so that's, that's one way of doing yeah. it. Um, you know, I think volume is really important because whatever you do, you've got to be able to scale it um, because obviously we're all under a lot of, lot, an awful lot of time pressure. Um, and I agree, it's not a case of just dispatch, give somebody a course and off they go. That's just not enough. That's, you know, in a busy news cycle, that's, it's, it's not fair on the individuals. You know, th this piloting process that we've been doing, I, I highlight that again, only, only to sort of emphasize that it's taken six a, a, a sort of crack squad of six people who spend the, a month living with the team, and in the and in, run, and in the run up to that month, they spend a lot of time doing one on one conversations with the whole team to find out what their issues and frustrations are, trying to get their journalism digitally through the BBC system. So, and and then it, within that month, they try and deliver to them the, the training that each individual feels they need. So they don't come along and say, "These are the five things we're just going to give to you, and you're going to do it." We respond to what those people say they feel is relevant to them. Um, but in parallel with, with supplying that training, what makes that, the two things I want to say that really I think has made that, that effective is one, by being in a process that's a month long, there are leaders who are invariably highly experienced journalists who've been through many of those layer cycles of going from news to 24-7 news channels, you know, to, to really, you know, people who've been in the business a long time. They, I, I, I've witnessed them go on a leadership journey, which sounds <laughs> crazy but it's true and um, they they start to talk and communicate with their teams in a completely different way so they start having different kinds of meetings at different times of the day and they start to create the space for their staff to take advantage of the training that we have been supplying so this again goes back to the importance of communication because in legacy media there is a classic way to run a meeting there is a classic meeting pattern in terms of the day, the week, that, that has always been, and they just rattle on like that, even though the meeting's probably rubbish. And, um, <laughs> and what we've been trying to do is unpick that and say, well, why do you have to have a meeting then? Why don't you have it then? Why does it have to be led by this person? Why can't it be led by, um, you know, the, the, it doesn't have to be you know, the youngest member of the bureau, but this is just one example that came up. Um, and by doing that, people have felt on unbur, they felt more creative, they felt more liberated, but the leader has gone on a journey where they've helped the staff give them more time and space to deliver this new style of content. So, for example, the Brussels Bureau was amazing. The guy who leads that is amazing. And he has got to a space whereby where he's going to send a team to uh, Spain. Or, you know, he sends them, ideally, 24 or 48 hours in advance of the news event so that they can gather uh, a original digi digital content that is going to be for the female audience or for the youth audience that's ready to go before they hit the news event, which would be the classic linear event on the day. So he came up with that system himself, but the joy of it, he has given his staff the time to do that content rather than expecting them to do it whilst they're doing the bulletins and breaking news and everything else, which never happens. Mm. So it's more than just delivering training. Again, communication, uh, leadership, and changing your working patterns is key to bring it all together. It's really interesting. Um, last year, uh, the editor-in-chief gave me the task of making sure that every single journalist at Reuters, which is 2,500 full-time and about another 500 contractors, so I had to get, make sure that 3,000 people learned a second skill. And there was no way on God's beautiful earth that I was going to be able to do that myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that we managed it was to get people in the bureaus to teach each other. So a photographer would hold workshops as to how to take good news 
photos that are good enough to make it to the wire. And we don't expect any of them to win a Pulitzer Prize, although you never know. Um, and most of them are taken off an iPhone. Um, but that had actually a sort of a, at least two different, well, three different benefits. Firstly, we now have 3,000 people who are able to take decent news photog photographs around the world versus 300 regular pho photographers. So that's a tenfold increase. Um, secondly, people who knew their colleagues by waving at them when they came in or went out for a coffee or stood on the doorstep with each other now had a better understanding of each other's craft because the photographers were also being taught and the VJs were also being taught by the text reporters what the key pieces of context and reporting were going to be needed for them to be able to write text to go with a visually led story. So it gave each other, all of the groups kind of had a new respect for each other's craft and a new um, ability to actually grow as a multimedia journalist, um, which is vital in the 21st century. Very few people now get a job if they can only report in one medium. But thirdly, um, it also allowed some of our photographers to think, you know what, that's good enough. You know, I don't have to hire a freelancer for 400 euros today to go and take those headshots. You know, the, the iPhone photograph was good enough, and, and that's fine. It's not going to be an archive use. It's not going to be um, something we put in the 100 top pictures of the year. And actually, good enough is good enough because, and I always quote this chap, Damir, who's our chief photographer in Beijing. And he was one of the first, he was one of the real early adopters of this. And he said, I train the texties to go and take the photographs that they can so that I have the time to go and take the photographs I should. And I just, I think, you know, why, why improve on perfection? So, um, but it's been interesting to see actually that the peer-to-peer -peer stuff has been, has been really important um, just to get people's hearts and minds into it as well as just the skills. And just the last point I would say on that is that as we did that, we realized that there was a gap and the gap was actually the editors. And the editors were, as Lucy was saying, the people with all the experience of journalism, fantastically good journalists. Um, and they could now take photographs or shoot video, and that was lovely, but they very rarely have the opportunity to do that. So this year we've started now, um, and it is more of a training course, but it's been very helpful to put them in the shoes of a client. So we just give them our content coming out and say, okay, yesterday's big story was Zuckerberg's testament, second part of the testimony. Build a website from the content that Reuters provided and tell me, what do you wish that Reuters had provided? And what do you think that we could have done better? Um, and what would you have liked to see? And just, again, like your Brussels Bureau Chief story, changing the mindset by getting people to think about how is our content being used in this day and age has been an incredibly valuable way of moving the needle. Mm -hmm. We have about 25 minutes left, so I want to open it up for questions. Um, and I don't know, do we have a microphone to yes. hand around for the questions. And whenever you ask your question, can you just say who you are and where you come from clearly so everybody's aware? And wait till the microphone gets to you. It's coming. Okay. Jason. Hello. I'm Jason Mehmed. I'm an independent consultant. Um, I wanted to ask about how do you think the physical design of newsrooms and spaces, how can that impact cultural change, particularly when you think about across teams across silos. Can I answer that? Go on. Um, I, <laughs> um, we'll, yeah, exactly. we'll, do, we'll do one each so oh. we can get around more questions. Um, I think it's absolutely key and it, it's, it's um, you know, the BBC has got sort of a, a cutting edge state of the art newsroom but already you know there's massive changes I would, I would make to it so you know um, for example, I think data visualization should be in the center of the newsroom so you can't get away from how things are performing. It's in your face, whether you're a truck, a satellite truck engineer or whether you're, um, you know, uh, the court reporter that day. Um, and we haven't got that that's off to the side and it's not on. So therefore, unless you're on the digital team, you're not even, it doesn't beat in your heart. Um, and also having a sort of core digital on team at the center of the, the you know, the, um, the news gathering ring, I think is absolutely core, but we've just run out of space, so we can't organize <laughs> it like that, so it's a complete nightmare. Yeah, and that's the problem as well, is that we live in a two-dimensional plane, sort mm. of flat. You know, kind of, we, we've just changed around our newsroom at Reuters, so that 
that we've got all the desks together. Mm. So in breaking news, everyone's actually talking to each other, which is radical. Um, but we were literally, somebody was saying, well, well couldn't, couldn't we just open up the next floor up and have people sitting there so you can shout <laughs> up and down? You're like, <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dennis Redmond. I teach international media at the uh, Graduate School of Journalism here in Perugia, embedded American, after a long career in the media. Uh, I would like to ask Lucy and the panel, for the very interesting panel, since the study in November, uh, can you name names or situations, new things that have evolved since the study? And what are organizations that were really able to change their soul or their DNA, apart from your organizations, that have preserved the core, the five Reuters value, the, the BBC mantra, uh, whatever, uh, those that have really transformed their mantra and have survived? And finally, how do you fight against email and meeting fatigue. <laughs> um, strong organizations. Uh, hang on, what do we have? We had changes since I've done it, since the research was done. Oh, sorry. Uh, changes, changes since the research was completed, organizations performing well and, and dealing with kind of excessive bureaucracy and whatever. Um, I said culture was one issue, people was, was one big issue that emerged from that. The other is just the sheer horror of the revenue challenge. And, and that is a, that is, I think that is really underestimated actually by journalists who are facing profound challenges of their own. But, but for just about, it, it's really a wicked problem. It's, it's really hard to see, you know, classic, Legacy media need a certain amount of scale to pay for the tech and, and, and find the journalists, and so they need those revenues coming in. And it's just a constantly shifting patchwork, and that is clearly continuing. So I think what we're seeing is, at a revenue level, uh, the patchwork is changing. So a big shift in, we've seen the shift into subscriptions, we're seeing the shift into events, the whole kind of newsletter event silo focused area. Who knows how long that will be the case. Um, the other thing that's coming in very big is AI. I'm seeing that, and, and actually the link between, uh, you know, big data was the thing, but now this AI, I think, is really profoundly hitting, and it was really interesting in the Zuckerberg testimony to see how much he's now actually offloading the challenge in terms of moderate, of controlling this content to AI. <laughs> you know, AI is going to do this. Note, he's not going to employ people, which they don't want to do because people don't scale. But so I think I think those are the two shifts there. In terms of the organisations, I think the fundamental challenge is working out what is the equivalent voice in digital. You know, how do we take our unique personal handwriting that we had in legacy, our identity, and make that work in digital? And the organizations that are stronger are using more of the talents of the organization to solve it. I mean, the thing that really hits you, and I was, you know, people were extraordinarily generous with their time, and I spoke to um, leading players in internationally, and what really strikes you is how bright these people are and how committed they are. And I think the challenge actually for leaders is cutting all of these bureaucratic sinews so that people are free to find their own solution. And, and the work is really not a recipe, do these, these things. What I've tried to do is pinpoint really good solutions from, from players and explain why they're good. Um, but the sheer talent in media organizations is extraordinary. You get really top level people going in there, very intelligent people and they are deeply committed. But often, to date, their, their skills have been limited to solving the journalistic problem. And what you see, the organizations that are moving ahead are using those, that, that sheer you know, uh, talent of the people to actually solve the big issue. And the person who put this best to me was you know, Marty Barron of Washington Post, who's a truly great leader. And he said, you know, I just say to my people, you are journalists, you are great investigative journalists, you cannot afford to try and solve problems in society and ignore the profound problem in our industry. You know, it, it, it behoves you to try and solve this organizational challenge as well, because otherwise we won't be able to do what we love doing. And what I saw in stronger organizations was a variant of that, essentially. And, and the problem, I think, for media and journalism is we've been slightly allergic to management, to organization, we're very allergic to jargon, we hate management jargon, we don't like consultants. And, and that's why language is really, really critical in culture change, and it's really important people, organizations find their own solutions, but it is about harnessing everyone's energies in trying to solve this. 
Thank you. Hello, my name is John Crowley. I'm a, a freelance journalist, but I had worked at several legacy uh, news organisations, so I'm getting, getting lots of flashbacks from, from this um, excellent PTSD. panel. PTSD. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing that I think will have chimed with lots of people in this room is what, what you said, Lucy. Having 30 years of experience does not necessarily equate to being the right person to bring about cultural change. So I'm going to talk about people right at the top of the organisation, the people right at the top who may uh, talk the talk but don't walk the walk, so to speak. Yeah. So we're talking about training younger kind of journalists, bringing them on. How do we cajole, inspire and train the leaders right at the top uh, without getting sacked? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take it? Or? Okay, I'll take it, I'll take it. I have a lot to say in this, but um, I would again say, and there's an element of this going on at the BBC at the moment, is um, audience data is um, really powerful, especially at the corporate top. So, you know, um, nearly two years ago, you know, I was banging on about the female audience, the young, everybody will know if you want to talk about the, the, the female, the young and, and the less well off. But in what I've noticed um, corporately is now the BBC, now they have a, a slogan called reinventing for the next generation. So what across the whole of the BBC, they have done a huge data crunching on the younger audience consumption, which obviously affects us all. And there has been, and that, that data, that pan BBC data reality check that's landed in recent months has totally changed, I think, the top level um, it's, you know, vibe. It's created that dissatisfaction, that sense of, right, we need, we need to get on this night and we need to align. And, that's, and I've watched that happen and I thought, mm, let's see what happens. And actually now it has now hit news because, you know, news tend to be very cynical and they kind of do whatever the hell they want anyway. Mm -hmm. But now it's hit news um, and they are to and now the messaging is focusing and the, and the meetings are changing, the composition of meetings are changing and it's all driven by that, this, this pan organization data that they got out that showed them about under 34 consumption patterns. So you've got to get something that's an existential threat to the people at the top as the people at the top and then you've got to leave that hard, yeah. Hey, uh, it's James Morgan from CrowdTangle. Fiona, I was mm. in the room when you became the controller mm. and the whole of the BBC mm. squeezed in to see yeah. the new mobile and online mm. controller unveil the strategy. Mm. And you asked a really powerful mm. question, which always stayed with me. Mm. You said, "How can? what is the thing mm. that we can all do less of yeah. and must do less of mm. to make room mm. for all these new exciting yeah. ideas? And so I, I kind of wanted to ask all of the panel, what have you asked your teams and organizations to stop doing that they might actually have liked doing, were comfortable doing, and would have been quite happy to go on doing yeah. to make room for all the new things? And how did you get them to stop? <laughs> oh, well, um, I can actually, I, I said earlier that, um, that we, it's very difficult to fire people in Sweden because of the laws so you you to get change you you need to do different things uh, and but what we have done twice the last seven years is that uh, we actually made reorganizations where everyone had to reapply for their jobs even management uh, that uh, so so you are safe you will still have you will be an employee always uh, but but uh, you might not uh, be able to do what you're doing now forever. And, uh, and this has, has um, created a flexibility, but also now people are getting a bit used to the fact that this will not go on, we, we will soon change again. We will need to adapt again. This is something that will be normal. Uh, and, and also the, the changing the culture in how you, look at careers has been very important. Uh, now we have some really, really brilliant um, people that used to be leaders, managers, that uh, for a few years come and be a, a fantastic reporter again, and then can move back into management. So that kind of, um, of um, unprestigious 
atmosphere is very important. Mm. Mm. Just one point there. Um, exits are really important because everyone is, has resource scarcity now. Everyone has too much to do, too little money. And it's really important. They're really much harder than you think. It's very difficult and painful to shut things down, close things down. And you need precedent. It's really important taking a few painless things just to show this is something we do in the organization. It's not, it doesn't mean a nuclear level change. This organization from time to time pulls out of areas, closes projects. You need to kind of normalize it. Um, because otherwise there simply are not the resources to cover all the bases that, needs to be co that need to be covered. And the world is changing fast. There will be new skills and, I mean, investments in things like AI are massive if they're going to work. So, and you need energy and attention for that. So, so normalize pulling out of areas, uh, make it less sensitive. And, and just to your point about how do you get them to stop, choose a couple of things that they hate doing. So we're about to allow some of our guys to stop doing a piece of work that they have bitched and moaned about for the last, since I joined, a long time. And they're about to get to stop doing it. And they are so happy about it. It's something that a machine should have been able to do a long time ago, and now a machine can. It's essentially bringing together a schedule for our media clients saying what's coming up. And we now have a new piece of technology, planning technology, and so you can now get the machine to do the majority of it, double check it as a human being and send it off. And it will save, I don't know, probably about 20, 20 hours a day around the world. So kill some of the things that, you, that they don't want to do. And then when you have the data to prove that other stuff isn't resonating, they might be happier to get on with it. Hello, um, I'm Jo Fay. I'm uh, Deputy Head of Multimedia co-lead social media at the International Service of the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation. Um, my question was, how do you keep the momentum going after mm -hmm. you've done training sessions or you've spent a month with a team? Obviously, you can't um, constantly monitor hundreds or thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep that momentum going after the initial phase? Uh, so if, if I can just pick up off, so off the back of our month-long pilot process that I've been banging on about, we had a lot of discussion about evolving that. And at the, at the end of it, there is another away day with that team, where the team commit to what are they, what changes in working practices or changes in content they're going to stick with. So they literally have to write a new mission statement, and then that is um, there is one of that crack team I was telling you about of one of that six stays in regular contact with them and continues to go to their meetings, continues to follow up, which as recently. Um, just escalated into one year on, we have another away day and we bring to them uh, an analysis deep dive of how their stats have changed one year on and they and their leader gives a presentation on from their point of view what has changed and I was looking back on some of those on the way here and um, for all of them, the engagement time has increased, the recirculation has increased, some things haven't done so well, so it's one team didn't hadn't done so well on, on SEO improvement. But the fact is they all had improved in some things and the, the, the content decisions that they were making were now completely different from a year hence. But So it's really important you do have a path of follow-up and continuing communication and continuing support afterwards because otherwise it will all just drop away. <laughs> yeah. uh, we probably have time for one more question. No. no, 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 we, we don't. don't. We don't have time for questions. Oh, okay. Okay. In that case, my watch is wrong. Okay. Um, like, so have we, have we stopped the stream? Just to understand? Yeah? Okay. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much thank indeed you. for coming. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Hi. Oh, excellent. Hi, thank you. Grazie. That's my only Italian. <laughs> um, thank you guys very much for coming. Oh, now I'm quite low. Um, my gosh, it's so wonderful to see a panel on gender and foreign correspondence like filled to capacity. Thank you're delighting my heart. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Gina Moore. Yes, yay! Gender and foreign correspondence. Um, I'm Gina Moore. I am the East Africa Bureau Chief for the New York Times. Uh, before that, I was the global women's rights reporter and a senior foreign correspondent for BuzzFeed News. Before that, I was a freelancer for seven years from uh, living in Rwanda. Um, that is not necessarily an expected career path in the United States, but that's what happened in reverse order. Um, and I am here with like an amazing panel of, of women reporters, one who may, she's still on the way, so hopefully we'll get a chance to hear from her um, before the end. Um, and, uh, and we're here today for a couple of notable reasons that I just want to share with you. I attended this conference last year and had a, a conversation with Diane Kemp, who had a panel this morning, she chaired a panel this morning on diversity in newsrooms, and um, we thought there were a couple of things we hadn't heard about at the conference last year that we wanted to hear about, so we just figured we'd pick the people we wanted to hear from and try to bring them to Perugia. Ergo, here we are. Um, and that was possible thanks to really generous support from the International Women's Media Foundation, which is based in Washington, D.C., and helped all of us get here, literally. So we're thrilled and excited to be here. Um, from next to me, my left, to you, my right, I suppose, this is Alison Baskerville. She's a working photographer, past photojournalist, now documentarian photographer, and also the founder of an organization called ROAR, which is a safety training movement to make sure that journalists however they identify, can get the kind of safety training that they need to feel comfortable working in the field um, and with various and many different kinds of employers. And she'll talk a lot about all those different things. Um, next to her is Anna Holligan, who's a BBC reporter in The Hague, the Netherlands. I thought she said she was a BBC hate reporter. She said, no, no, Hague reporter. <laughs> so the Dutch city, not the crazy thing taking over some of our politics. Um, and uh, she works as a freelancer and is going to talk about how gender and freelance and other things about gender identity that have nothing to do with our work um, impact our work. And then Jean Lee, who is now the director for the Wilson Center's Korea program, the Woodrow Wilson Center for uh, Scholars in Washington, D.C. Prior to that, opened the Associated Press's uh, bureau in Pyongyang in North Korea. Um, and you were the Korea's bureau chief, is that right, for the AP? Yes, From yeah. Seoul? So why, why do just one bureau when you could do two in a completely closed country that nobody's ever worked in before? Because, you know, uh, so we're going to hear from, from, from Jean as well. I just wanted to share a little bit before we get started. Um, oh, well, and two bits of housekeeping. We were supposed to have Deuce Namwezi, who is an incredible Congolese journalist, join us. But the Italians denied her a visa, so she is not here. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about her work, which I know and, and find very impressive. Um, and Cassandra Vinograd, who's a freelance conflict reporter, um, is driving a, in the manner of freelance conflict reporters as quickly as possible from the airport to try and join us. So hopefully that, that will work out. Um, so Diane and I were talking last year about uh, uh, gender issues and, 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 and the kinds of conversations we we're having at the conference. And then... Over time, I found myself thinking about, a lot about this last year. And at the end of last year, in the American media, there's a little space called the Neiman Lab. Um, and someone wrote a, an essay that was like, you know, there aren't any female foreign correspondents. We need more women doing foreign correspondent jobs. This gender bias must end. And I thought, okay, in general, I'm for ending gender bias. True. Um, but I also realized that that didn't really reflect my experience. When I read that, I was sitting in Nairobi as the East Africa Bureau Chief for the New York Times. My colleagues in Nairobi, the Bureau Chief for Reuters, the Deputy Bureau Chief for Reuters, the Bureau Chief for CNN, the head of Al Jazeera, um, and others were also women. And I thought, okay, maybe Nairobi is somehow special. That's entirely possible. Um, but there seemed to be something kind of new and different going on that wasn't totally reflected in like the internet. 
Um, and that kind of conversation. So then I thought more about it, and I thought, okay, around me here in Nairobi, there are also some really innovative journalism organizations bringing new kinds of news to people. There's something called Bright Magazine that's taking a new and critical and deep look at um, what we call development journalism um, and, and solutions-oriented journalism. There's a project in Kenya called Journalists for Justice, trying to connect what happens in The Hague um, to Kenyan readers and, and beyond that to African readers, whose leaders are usually the ones on track trial in The Hague and to bridge the conversation that's happening in Europe about what happens in Africa and bringing it back to Africa so that it's told by Africans but through this expert um, lens. The four books I know about Syria are written by women. Um, and then I got really curious and I was like, well, let me poke around a little bit more. The, um, the Washington Post's bureau chiefs in Jerusalem, Beirut, Hold on, I wrote it all down here. Kabul and Islamabad are all women, and they are all serving in what someone at my organization recently referred to as high-octane jobs, um, which I thought was interesting. There's a lot of women who don't work in traditional institutions who do what I like to think of, now that I know the term, as high-octane work, and I think I'm sitting with some of them here today. Um, and while I say that, I also want to acknowledge that there's a problem with the notion of high octaneism. We still tell, you know, we can talk about gender in journalism, we can talk about female foreign correspondents. When we do that, we're talking about freelancers who take different sets of risks than those of us with staff jobs do. When we're talking about women who are navigating a staff structure, we're talking about a kind of different set of, of challenges to overcome. Um, but we're all mostly working in a model that privileges a very masculine perspective on conflict reporting. And, and treats that as sort of the pinnacle of, of, of achievement. And especially when we're younger, I think we have um, the incentive structure is aligned to push us in that direction so that we can sort of, you know, uh, tick all the notches on the belt. If you're a freelancer, you try to earn a staff job by going into Syria. All these problems we know about because we've been talking about them more openly in the last four or five years than we ever have before. So I want to put out there that as I talk about that, I'm also talking about a structure that necessarily has embedded in it what I think is a particular kind of male perspective. I like to call it the male gaze, but that's with a Z-E, just to be clear. Um, and then I think there's also a lot of women doing amazing work who are challenging the ways we just tell stories or who we tell stories about. There's a woman called Fatia Abubakar who works out of Borno State in Nigeria. You'll probably, if you don't know where Borno State is, you certainly know Boko Haram. And so Borno State is kind of the, the, the home, the, 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 the headquarters of Boko Haram. And Fatia has an Instagram feed called Bits of Borno that are absolutely beautiful photographs of everyday life in Borno, the kind of thing that we don't often see in the traditional media, and when we do, it's celebrated in ways that make it like just a little bit weird, right? Like it's actually much more normal than sometimes it seems. There's a woman called Omnia Shakwat in uh, Khartoum who built an online magazine to look at um, digital and multimedia cultures and the kinds of things that weren't being represented in traditional media in Sudan and South Sudan. That's expanding now in East Africa. Um, there's a woman I love to read anything she writes called Rafia Zakaria, who does mostly commentary work and, and writes books, but challenges repeatedly, consistently, and really usefully, I think, um, things about how the structures that we have embedded in the language we use for stories when we're talking about um, women in quote unquote Muslim countries, right? Or Muslim women in Western countries and all the kinds of cliches and stereotypes and assumptions that get made in those conversations. So. As we, if I were writing this out, I would say TLDR. There's a lot of cool women doing a lot of cool work that are changing the way we understand the world around us. And what I was really excited to do was be able to collect some of the women that I think are doing really cool stuff and have them tell you things. So that's what we're gonna do. With that, I'll let Allie be the first cool person to tell you stuff. <laughs> I hate being first, but you were technically first. I'm, can you hear me? I'm not. Do you want me to go closer? Sorry, I'll bring it a bit closer. There we go. Um, I had, I always do this. I always have something prepared to tell you about. And then as I'm listening to everyone around me, I start to change it in my head because I realize there's lots of things coming up, especially um, this is only my second conference um, in my life. So even this as a space is something I'm really learning a lot about. Um, so I'm going to talk on two levels, really. I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about my own journey as a photojournalist and why I class myself as a former photojournalist now, um, and also about my own work um, with other people in doing hostile environment training or safety training uh, in a slightly different way um, to perhaps more conventional practices and why I got to that point. 
Uh, and that's all I can really share. I mean, it's, it's important for us to hear our own perspectives, but also when I'm talking to you about this stuff, I think what I've also learned is that when you learn to decenter from your own stories, when you really start to learn about other people's experiences, and um, that's a good place for me to start about why I became uh, slightly uh, more disillusioned with the role of photojournalism and how it reflected in how we represent people um, and how we other people and how we class them as different to us and how we often portray them as victims rather than survivors. So that was really the basis for a lot of the work that I do now. Um, and my history is um, within the military, uh, very institutionalized, um, and I was completely blind to um, my white skin. I was completely blind to my gender. Um, I didn't feel like I was discriminated against at all, but in fact I was, because I had a level of ignorance that meant that I wasn't aware of that level of discrimination. Um, and as a photojournalist, I followed the set route of photographing uh, in places of conflict. I have an ex-military background. It was easy for editors to send me to front lines. Uh, I was more than able to work in those um, places. I was physically and emotionally resilient enough to do that. But I also had a level of um, safety training and also knowledge that gave me a certain sense of privilege that didn't really come into play until I started working around freelance photojournalists, but more importantly, local journalists and local fixers and realized that they were taking extreme levels of risks to satisfy the need of the international media community. Um, and that's when I took a step sideways and thought, okay, as a, as a photojournalist and as a female photojournalist, I am representing um, a, a part of the industry that's still very much male-dominated, and, and I think that's valid, but equally, how much space am I making for female photographers of color who are also working alongside me and have the same credibility to enter things like World Press Photo, but have, don't have the confidence because no one's opening the doors or helping open the doors, right? So I thought, well, what does that mean? As in, how can I do something about that without putting myself in white savior role and trying to um, patronize uh, women and men of color who are working in industry by saying, hey, I'll help you out, I'll give you this, I'll do that. Because that's kind of like, it's tired, that narrative, and people keep wheeling that out because there are really, really competent uh, people working out there um, shooting their own stories. And I realized that a, re a really good friend of me, like th of mine three years ago, uh, said to me, she said, you know what, Alison, we're really tired of telling white people how to talk to us, what it's like to be black. Go to Google and start Googling, right? Start doing your own research. Like, if you want people of color to tell you how to deal with us, pay us, right? We'll be your mentors, but give us a day rate. So I realized that there was a, there was a power balance, and then I started looking at white privilege and how I could kind of perhaps understand that better so that when I was talking to people of color, I wasn't traumatizing them with my ignorance. So. Um, it's a long story, this is, but this is how I started to think more deeply about representation and how my role as a female photojournalist was very valid when I was thinking about gender representation in the sphere of white feminism, but when it comes to women of color, it was still like very far away. So then I started reading uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's essay about intersectionality, and I realized that there was another level a deeper level that we had to go to really to make the industry more joined up and to create better bridges together so we actually start working across those boundaries instead of reinforcing them by saying I'm a woman and I work with diverse communities. No, you are diverse as a person and you're working in a community. Does that make sense? So we're not just saying I, I because people say terrible phrases like I don't see color. So that means you're erasing their heritage, their ancestry. And we all have it, right, as people. Whiteness doesn't mean that you don't have a, a heritage. You do. So I did a lot of reading. Um, I wound down my photojournalism quite a lot because every time someone phoned me and asked me to go to Africa to cover a story, I would ask them, who's already there? Who have you got already on the ground who can actually produce this content for them? And do you have a plan for them? Do they have access to safety equipment? Do they have medical training? And it asked a lot of questions that I don't think people have been asking. Um, other than media NGOs, who were talking about this constantly, about supporting local people on the ground. 
Um, so I kind of went away again. <laughs> I do a lot of going away and coming back and speaking to people. Um, and I've been really helpfully mentored by lots of different people over the last few years. I've listened to stories of physical risk, emotional risk, how you build better emotional resilience with physical resilience instead of this gung-ho, uh, very masculine approach to war photography, kind of get yourself in there, get the pictures, doesn't matter if I die. That stuff is not okay for you to have a long, sustainable, professional career. And also, what are you doing to the people that you're photographing? How are you representing them? Have you got their names? Do you know anything about them? How are you connecting to them? How are you empathizing with them? Um, and then the other layer of that was um, speaking to other female colleagues who'd been on assignment or also living in that environment who were experiencing large amounts of harassment, sexual violence, and in the worst case, had been raped whilst on assignment not by strangers, um, but by people in their teams, people they worked alongside, and that sometimes it was people in positions of power, gatekeepers, editors, senior editors. I think you all kind of understand where I'm going with that. And I realized that there was another thing that we weren't really addressing at all. Um, so I set up something called RAW. It's called RAW because I think regardless of how you um, put yourself out in the world, however you identify, your gender orientation, whether you even associate to a gender, because I think we're really bored of this very cisgendered, heterosexual approach to talking about these things on panels, male, female, often very about straight people. If you're queer, if you're a queer person of color, you don't get a voice in the room at all. Um, so I think for me, feeling safe in your own skin was about, well, what does that mean? Because everybody has a different view of how they feel safe, what their personal safety threshold is. So RAW is going to take a long time because on a practical level, I'm now teaching specifically around the area of sexual and gender-based violence, but to different people. So people come to the room and I facilitate sessions to ask them about what they actually need rather than telling them what they need. And in often in many cases, kind of white explaining what they need. When in actual fact, they're the subject matter expert. They're the people that are coming to me and saying we need this. So I have a set of skills that I can, I've been privileged to get right, through having a certain passport, through having a certain skin color, through having a certain access to money. So now it's now bringing that back out. And being a good ally is actually about stepping sideways or even stepping back and actually just listening. So RAW will take a long time because I'm building it on listening to people um, and using my experience to make some relevant training. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is that um, whilst I'm always keen to support um, other women on panels like this, and I think it's important. I think uh, the makeup of panels has to change. Um, I would like to see people from the queer community sat on these panels. I would like to see men sat on these panels talking about this. I'd like them to be fully engaged with the conversation and not sitting in a level of discomfort like it doesn't belong to them, because it absolutely does. All of this belongs to all of us. Um, so when it comes to the safety training side of life, I don't want it to be a privilege thing for people to get because they've got like thousands of dollars spare, right? This should be built into your university programs. It should be built into your mindset when you're thinking about a career in journalism. And I just want to make that as accessible to people as possible. Um, and I will charge big media companies lots of money so I can do it for a fiver for my friends back in Birmingham who get no access to this level of training whatsoever. And I get more satisfaction in doing that to like 18 to 30 year old BAME women who are like, I don't even know how to leave my house safely because I'm not allowed to leave by my father. And these are things that we don't think about because we can just walk down the street and feel safe most of the time. Um, I think I'm going to finish there, but that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Um, I told you I was going to read about this book and I'd completely changed my mind. We might get there. We might get there. And, and to the like almost dozen women in the room, with that note, I say a special welcome and we're happy to hear from you. But later. Go ahead. Thanks, Gina, and thanks, Ali. Um, I am not really used to doing this kind of thing. I'm used to talking about other people's stories and experiences. So um, to tell you a little bit about me, when I tell people that I am a TV reporter and I work for the BBC, I'm a freelancer, uh, and I work all over Europe breaking news stories. And when I mentioned that I'm now doing this with a baby, People talk about the BBC dad, 
Has everyone seen the BBC Dad? <laughs> Kids come running in, hilarious, viral. But when I saw that, I thought, okay, it's funny, but would it be the same if my baby appeared on screen? Would people be laughing or would they be saying, ooh, you really should have dealt with that, like she should be looked after elsewhere or you shouldn't be doing this, you can't have these two things simultaneously. So that's what I've been dealing with for the last year and a half and kind of trying to manage these two things which I love and care for deeply, my career and my daughter and trying to work out how to maintain both of those to the level that I aspire to for myself, but also for younger women who are gonna face these same kinds of issues when they come up. And what I discovered when I started doing this was that there weren't any rules. There, were no, there was nothing written in the BBC rule book or guidelines about how I could keep my daughter with me. I don't know how we can show pictures can we show any pictures? I've got some pictures just to make this kind of come to life. Yeah. Yes. So that's what I do. That's my baby. Uh, <laughs> I can get this. Yeah. Her name is Zena. Uh, and that was when she was maybe about six weeks old. She looks like an alien there, but she's, she's really cute, honestly. Um, anyway, so my idea was that I would kind of. Um, I go back to work and juggle her. This is her a little bit more recently. We're about to go live and she's really involved now and she can pick up the mic and say hello to London <laughs> <laughs> when we're dialing in. Uh, and um, yeah, so I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to work and uh, she's going to be there in the buggy. And I was really naive because until you have a baby, you don't really know what it entails, really honestly. Uh, so that's me recording a piece for Radio 4 and breastfeeding at the same time because it was the only way that I could get her to be quiet. And all of these things about, yeah, really, I think I'd taken her off the breast there just for the photo. Um, but anyway, that's, there, there are ways of managing a baby and recording in live TV and live radio and all that kind of thing. So anyway, to go back, um, I gave birth um, after 30 hours of labour and anyone who's done that knows how intense it can be and if you haven't given birth already, you can imagine, uh, and then an emergency C-section. So after five weeks, I felt like I could um, be reporting again, so let me just spin through this. So this was, okay. This was the first day back at work after five weeks. Uh, and um, she was in the buggy and it was all fine. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do this one day of work. It was the, a guy at the ICC who was appearing accused of uh, tearing down the mausoleums in Timbuktu. So I thought, right, one day and then I'll head back and look after the baby intensively for another few months. And then um, I just thought, actually, that was all right. So the next day, um, there was some more demand, and I think, uh, I don't know, that, that, <laughs> that was it. That's not you. That was a few days later. Um, so anyway, um, so then I did the next day, uh, and it was radio, and my husband was meant to look after the baby. We had a... Uh, discussion, he decided he didn't want to do that, so I thought, okay, so I can say I'm not able to do the radio today, or I can strap her onto my front and I can jiggle around while I talk on air, and that's what I did. And that's kind of how it's been for the last year and a half. And this morning was at the International Court of Justice, this guy's a judge, obviously, uh, and the Today programme, which is like a big programme in the UK, uh, uh, radio programme, they called and said, oh, we know you've just had a baby, but do you think there's any way you can manage this? Uh, and I said, yeah, fine. So 15 minutes later, we were breaking the news outside the ICJ, and she was happy, and uh, I faced loads of questions about whether it's the right thing for her, whether it's the right thing for the BBC, how people feel about the BBC's reputation, where I, when I rock up with a baby, how people respond to that. And I genuinely haven't had any negative responses to people in the field, either interviewees or anything else. Sometimes, like the guy who you saw right at the start, just ignored it. Like I had a baby attached to my phone. <laughs> just like he didn't see it <laughs> and, and really I don't do these panels because I really feel uncomfortable talking about myself but the fact that nobody was talking about it and I didn't know how to manage this 
makes me feel really passionately like young girls in the future shouldn't be having to deal with all of these issues themselves or thinking like some women do, okay, I'm really, really ambitious and I really love my career. Mm -hmm. In order to continue it, I'm gonna have to kind of hold off having a baby or wait to have a baby and then for so many women it becomes too late. So many of my friends who are flying in this industry keep on rising because they haven't had a baby and I think that there is something missing there mm. for women who don't want to have to depend on the goodwill of a partner or a man yeah. to keep on doing the job that they love and that's partly why I think so many women are just disappearing from the industry because it becomes like a battle or like you feel like mummy guilt that you can't give everything to one or the other. And so, um, let me see what else we have here. Uh, so this was at the ICC when she was um, five weeks old, and that's the, uh, the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, Fatih Ben Souda. And just after this, before this photo was taken, she had cuddles with the baby. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, it was summer, so that's why she's um, uh, not very, well dressed and afterwards she wanted the baby back for more cuddles and I picked her up and realized that she'd um, filled her nappy <laughs> and it was <laughs> kind of leaking through the bottom so I handed her over to the prosecutor and thought no actually we're gonna have to go now and um, so I walked back to the car with her and she was leaky all over me and I thought oh my god this is not <laughs> This is not the dream. I'm not living the dream here. But actually, <laughs> if you look at the photos, then, you know, I am. And I believe in mojoing as well. And I spoke to my boss, editor, yesterday, and he said, make sure that you don't look like just the BBC correspondent with a baby, because that will detract from your 10 years working for the BBC, breaking news and doing some of the biggest stories in Europe. And that is true. But it's also important to acknowledge that this is happening. And I really, really believe in mojoing, mobile journalism, and everything is possible with a smartphone, etc. So this is a day where we went to film at a school in Amsterdam. And you can see her looking at the camera like, yeah, what? This is what we do. <laughs> like, my mum's filming. She's going to edit. And she's got a baby. So the other thing, like when I talk to the health and safety and the hostile environment people inside the BBC about what I was doing, um, they obviously had a duty of care to me, and it's really important to talk about this, um, because they had to make sure I understood that if I was going to take my baby to report from the edge of a road, then they wouldn't be responsible for the insurance. So much of this is common sense, mm -hmm. um, but they have to say it. The BBC is not going to cover my daughter's insurance, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's fine. And obviously, when you're a parent, or you don't even have to be a parent to understand, if you have a child, then their safety comes before everything else anyway. So it kind of goes without saying. Um, but there were also things um, I was advised not to talk too much about because it might make other women feel the kind of pressure to do these things. So maybe don't share too much uh, and that I should be aware that um, I shouldn't make people have to think about my baby when it came to deployments, otherwise it could put people off deploying me on a story because they would think, oh God, yeah, but she's got a baby, so maybe we need to... So all of those things came up and they haven't really actually been resolved um, in a way that I think is a good way to be passed on to people who are gonna come up against these same obstacles and barriers in the future, and it shouldn't be an obstacle, it shouldn't be a barrier, it should be just something that women can do. But also, when I talk to other women, they say, yeah, you know, you've got to make sure your partner is involved in that and is willing to step up. It shouldn't be about stepping up. It should mm. be about when you're parents and you take an equal role. But, and that's onto a whole other issue of the institutions and how women and men have different rights to paternity leave and all that kind of stuff, um, which is for another panel, probably. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to see if there's anything else I wanted to really tell you. Because um, it was obviously difficult from me than it was for BBC staff reporters because if you're staff then you take maternity leave and then you go back to work and you have someone to look after your child and so that was the other concern that people wanted me to 
make sure that I wasn't having a life that others would want because I was freelance, so I had more flexibility in having her. She's obviously not with me there. Uh, and um, so occasionally pe other people do look after her when I have to do long days of live TV and that kind of thing. But that's what I'm doing. Uh, so uh, yes, it's really nice to be here and, and talk about it but I fear that there are not many other women who are doing the same thing yet just because of all of those issues. So, mm. thank you. I'm gonna drag this a little closer. I have so many questions for you. But <laughs> And I think you raised some really good points because um, throughout my career, I felt that I've had to make a choice between my career and my mission, which I will talk to you about, and having a family. And there's absolutely no way that I could have done what I did in North Korea if I had a family. And I'm a little bit bitter about the fact that we have to make those decisions or that we feel like we have to make those decisions. And so this is something that we need to talk about as women because no one told me when I was a kid growing up in the United States with this dream of being a journalist, being a foreign correspondent, that it was such a macho world. I wasn't told that. You know, I was, I was encouraged to dream big. I come from a family. Uh, my grandfather was a journalist in South Korea. He really instilled in me a love of stories and a love of sharing what I saw in the world. And he used to give me assignments and make me write down everything I saw in South Korea when I would go to visit. So I was very early given assignments as a foreign correspondent. But I wasn't given the tools to think about how I would do that as a woman. So, a woman. so I'm really glad that you're, you're talking about these things. Um, now, I did prepare some photos as well because I find that with North Korea, people want the visuals because it's a place that we don't get too many. And, and you raised some very interesting points that I want to discuss as well um, about distance because I think that's one of my concerns about coverage of North Korea is that there's this gulf between us and the North Koreans, uh, and one of my missions was try to bridge that gulf. Let me see if I can get the photos up and see if they work. And I, I was just thinking of having this, oh no, it's all in Italian. <laughs> Let me see if I can figure this out. Um, my Italian is fluent, apparently. Um, I just thought I would try to, try to scroll through this. There's no particular order, but I, I find that photos and video tend to provoke some interesting discussion. Um, but let me just go back to, I told you a little bit about myself. I'm a second generation Korean American. My parents were born in Korea when it was one country. And uh, they ended up in, they're born and raised in Seoul, South Korea, so on the southern side. Um, emigrated to the United States as graduate students. Uh, and that's where I was born and raised. But I knew throughout my career, my, I did get my professional start in South Korea, an English language newspaper, and I knew that I would always go back to South Korea at some point as a foreign correspondent. Uh, what I did not know was that it would be North Korea that, uh, that I would be going to. People often ask me, when did I decide I was going to work in North Korea? And I said, that was not something I ever thought I would do. I always thought I would be like the rest of us on the outside looking in. But it was on my first day of work as the AP Seoul bureau chief almost 10 years ago. It'll be 10 years in September that my boss told me, what you're really here to do is open an office in North Korea. Now, for any of you who've, who's worked in Asia, you know how hard it is to get a visa to get into North Korea. Uh, and so the prospect of having to open an office there was just mind-boggling. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, at the time, ten, you know, uh, there was no American news presence inside North Korea. Still to this day, the AP is the only news agency that has, the only American news agency that has a presence there. The only media outlets that have a regular presence there are the Chinese and Russian outlets, so CCTV, Xinhua, the state news agency, uh, People's Daily, uh, and eTartos. So there is a small pool of foreign correspondents, Chinese and Russian, in Pyongyang, but what the AP, what the president of the AP at the time wanted to do was to open bureaus in places that were A, 
former enemies or current enemies of the United States, and places where we didn't have much of a presence and that we wanted to get on the ground. Now, this is always a controversial and, uh, I think, debatable issue, is whether it's worth getting on the ground in a place like North Korea where our access is limited. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll just... Um, so, I'm not going to go into the details of how it is I opened the office in North Korea, but I can tell you that I sacrificed a liver. There is a lot more. There is a what? lot. <laughs> there was a lot of drinking involved. Um, there is a lot more to um, negotiating. Uh, it, this is. It's interesting because I went into journalism to tell stories about people whose voices I felt hadn't been heard, communities that were underrepresented. This started in California, where I was writing about Hmong farm workers, Mexican day laborers, and also about immigration issues, writing stories that I felt weren't being heard. Um, but I think I've applied those same skills to the people of North Korea. Um, but uh, one thing that I was not prepared for as a journalist was to be a diplomat. And working in a place like North Korea required so much diplomacy. Well, I'm not sure that diplomats would say they had to sacrifice a liver as well. But uh, there is so much more to trying to work in a place like North Korea where there's this gulf of uh, a cultural divide, a language divide, a political divide. Remember that this is a country that still technically remains at war with the United States. So I was an American journalist going into enemy territory. But, and, and on the eve of the day that we were going to open the bureau, my colleague David turned to me and said, everything in your life has led you to this point. You've used everything that you have, your language abilities, your ethnicity, your uh, people skills, your skills as a journalist to get to this point. And he was absolutely right. I had to pull everything that I had in my repertoire as an ethnic Korean, as an American, as a journalist, as somebody who learns how to, has, had learned how to speak to people and get them to tell their story. So everything that I had honed up until that point to try to get this bureau open. Um, now one thing, I should mention that um, I just, I also want to take a second to thank you for bringing me here. It is so nice to get out of the bubble of North Korea news. It is such an intense time right now, as you probably know, but it's also good to get a little perspective. Okay, frankly, I'm, I'm thinking about the food as well because I'm, I'm starving right now. <laughs> <laughs> Stomach is grumbling. Um, but also, it is so important for me to... Uh, to serve as an, as an example. Uh, you know, when I got into this field, uh, when I started this project of trying to open a bureau, I did look to see who my forebears were at the Associated Press. Who were the men and women who covered this country before me? Actually, there weren't any women. And they were, they were all men. They were all white men. Um, and uh, I remember I actually went through some of their old dispatches back in the day. I tell my students that we used to feed pieces of paper into something called a telex machine. I never actually did it myself. They still find a typewriter so ancient that they can't comprehend it. Uh, but I did actually find some of the original telex uh, papers that they fed through the machine. And it was interesting, the languages that they used, they called the North Koreans the Reds. So this was back in the 1950s. And they called the South Koreans peasants. And so I sometimes think they'd probably turn over in their graves if they knew that the child of one of these peasants was now running the AP office in Seoul. So that's how far things have come. And so I'm very proud of the fact that at the time when I became the bureau chief, I was the only woman bureau chief in Asia for AP. Uh, and with that comes a lot of sacrifices. Uh, but um, I'm very proud to sh be able to show what a woman can do in a place like North Korea. And I'll show you a little bit about um, what that means. So this is, I, I, I don't know, do you want me to walk through some of these photos and tell you what it is we're seeing here? So one of the things, uh, talk about, well, you, can, you see that I'm ethnic Korean. One of the tools that I found incredibly helpful was to learn their dialect. So my Korean, I will admit, is not very good. I am a second generation. I grew up in, I, it is my first language, but as soon as I could, I stopped speaking it. Mm. Um, but it worked to my advantage. 
because when I, when I started negotiating with the North Koreans, they looked at me, they heard me speaking Korean and said, well, you're definitely not a spy for South Korea because your Korean just isn't good enough. <laughs> um, and so they knew very clearly that I was, and they could, because this is always the risk, is that you're going to be taken uh, as a spy. Uh, I do think that I was always treated with the scrutiny that somebody in espionage would be treated. And so that meant 100% surveillance, 100% monitoring, uh, and this certainly affects the kind of work that we do. Um, but, they, but they did know that I was an American and they could understand that I was a, an ethnic Korean from overseas. And they actually have experience with these communities. They have ethnic Koreans who live in China and Japan that they rely on quite a bit to serve as a bridge. So they were able to look at me and see me as an ethnic Korean from America. Somebody who doesn't fit the stereotype of, a, of an American because their propaganda is so extreme. It starts from the time they're very little and shows Americans as their enemy. But I didn't look like that enemy. So for, for them, that gulf was already, wasn't there. They looked at me and saw me as a Korean. Now, when you are going through North Korea, if you don't look like them, obviously, you get a certain, they learn to put a mask on. And so it's very hard, if you're not able to bridge that gulf, to really get a sense for what they're thinking and who they are. Uh, because I look like them to a certain degree, and by the end of my tenure there, I was able to pass for North Korean. So I did have certain tricks, and um, we know that this was the case because when I carried my camera, I have it in my bag, but it's a, it's a professional Canon camera, about 30 times a day I would have North Koreans coming up to me asking how much I charge for a, a photo. Because most North Koreans don't, can't afford their own camera. So photographers go around with tiny little portable printers and they'll charge about 3,000 North Korean won to take their portrait. Um, and so I use this as an opportunity to tell my staff, well, this is what we're going to do. They all think I'm a North Korean photographer. We're gonna charge 2,800, undercut the rest. <laughs> teach them about capitalism. Um, but it was, <laughs> it was beneficial in the sense that uh, I was able to, by learning their dialect, and their dialect is a little bit like, I compare it to, to learning how to speak with a, a British accent. Um, it's a different intonation, it's a different dialect, it's a different vocabulary. Um, they spell their letters, letters a little bit differently. So you're speaking the same language, but in a slightly different way. Uh, by learning how to speak their dialect, I was able to bridge that gulf and to chat with them in a way that I think most foreign correspondents aren't able to. So this is a picture I took. Um, these are the kind of moments that I absolutely cherish. Just a construction worker taking a, a few minutes um, rest at a, a, a high-profile construction project. This is the construction of a hydroelectric power station. But just one of those candid moments that we don't often get to see. Just to show you a little, these are two of my colleagues from AP, just a little uh, to show you what it's like to, we were constantly looking at things through a window. Um, but it did give, riding the train up to, we were going to a rocket launch pad, um, did give us a chance to see what the countryside is like. Because one thing I will tell you is that if you do get access as a foreign correspondent, often it's at the invitation of the government on a very short orchestrated propaganda tour. And so by opening an office in North Korea, I was able to spend weeks on end there and get to see the country in between the theater. And that was absolutely crucial to being able to capture this place away from the drama and the theater that they wanted us to project. So you get to see things like this, getting outside of the capital city and seeing what the countryside looks like, the devastation and the envir environmental degradation, the reality of what daily life is like for North Koreans. If you look on my Instagram feed, you'll see, uh, if you scroll back far enough, you'll see images where I start the morning in North Korea in a scene like this and end the day in South Korea to the same mountains but absolutely verdant, covered with trees uh, and not as destroyed as, as they are in North Korea. So you see a little bit of the contrast between North and South because I did go between the two Koreas. The opportunity to get inside homes, which is something that we don't get to see very often. And to go to small villages that have been destroyed by flooding. So often I was taken to these villages. Uh, I, was, I, was, I asked to go to these villages and was told I was the first American 
to visit these places. So I was very aware that I played not only a role as a journalist, but as a representative of my country. It was the first time people were meeting Americans. But you can see this is not the kind of image that you usually see from North Korea or that you see um, from our foreign media coverage. I don't think that any other foreign correspondents have been able to go to a village like this and see a, a, a village that is cut off from electricity, where they have no clean water, they have no access to food. Inside a home. It's just fascinating if you take a look at it. Of course, in every home you'll have the portraits of the leaders, in this case, portrayed on um, calendars. These calendars have, are from, I think, 2002, so they're meant as decoration and homage to the late leaders of North Korea. But you can see the kind of attention to detail, even though it's, this is in the countryside on a farm, the doilies on <laughs> to protect and cover their appliances. This family had a, you can see the DVD player, they had a, a generator because in the countryside, of course, one the, once the sun sets, that's when you, have, you lose your access to light and electricity. But also, if you, just if you notice, she's wearing a, a t-shirt that shows 101 Dalmatians. So a little bit of a, uh, showing this is something that's imported from China, but also showing their exposure to uh, American Disney cartoons. Again, portraits of the late leaders on the wall of the bedroom. And just a little bit of a candid moment with these puppies. I did ask them, uh, because they do eat dog in North Korea, I did ask if they were, they were pets, and they said they are pets, but we are going to eat them. Now, I don't mean... <laughs> I am a dog lover, and I don't mean this to be any kind of animal rights issue, but it's a reality for North Koreans that it's one of the only sources of protein that they have. One of my friends asked me, my South Korean friends asked me to take some video inside a barber shop. Just everyday scenes, right? I, I think this one is hilarious because it almost looks like Kim Jong-un sitting in that seat, right? <laughs> because that haircut is very popular. Contrary to popular notion, it is not required to get your hair like Kim Jong-un, but it is, it is very popular. And this one I like because the, the barber is actually deaf. One of the things I had asked was to be able to see how the disabled were treated in North Korea. So I was able to see some disabled who were given skills and brought out of the shadows and into, into daily life. So that's another aspect of this that was very nice to be able to see. Just a street scene, I think, that captures a little bit of the, the fashion that we're starting to see in North Korea, and also cell phones. So from in the time that I've been there, which has been 10 years, we've, I think cell phone, the use of cell phones has been the most powerful development in North Korea because it has given them an uh, opportunity to communicate with one another. And the cell phone network is divided. North Koreans can call one another, but I could, they could not call me. And I could call my sister in Brooklyn, but I could not call my North Korean staff. So it's a divided network, yet one of the many, many tools designed to keep the uh, North Koreans separate from foreigners, and one of the challenges that we face uh, in, in trying to reach the North Korean people. But just like us, they walk down the street texting now, so they're starting to develop a lot of that cell phone um, addiction that we're, we're, we're already accustomed to. Again, another candid shot that I wanted to show you how we bridge the gulf um, between us and the, um, the North Koreans. These are just two soldiers that I happened to come across while walking through downtown, and I stopped to talk to them. One of my, my uh, staff's favorite game was to see how far I could go in chatting with the North Koreans before they had to step in and say, you know she's an American, don't you? Because it's actually illegal for them to interact with Americans or foreigners without permission. Uh, and I did start to chat with these guys, and I asked them what they were doing, and they said, we built this neighborhood. We built these buildings, and we're enjoying the fruit, fruits of our labor. So we had a, a nice little chat, but it was good to, it was, good, it was important for me to see the sense of pride that they felt, because previous to that, I had been to this military construction site and had only noticed that they were moving everything by hand, brick by brick. And so I only saw the hardship, and I hadn't seen the sense of pride that they they had in building these buildings. So help me understand a little bit of, of the North Korean perspective behind some of these big propaganda projects. This is a picture I took last year on May Day. One of the few things that North Koreans can do, uh, despite the hardship that they face, is have a picnic. So the most common 
thing that they'll do on a holiday or on a day off is have a picnic. And you can see the sense, this is a very different vision of the North Koreans, right? And um, what I love here is to keep an eye on that grandpa. <laughs> Singing and dancing, also free. This is also something that they like to do on their days off. Doesn't cost money. He actually eventually did get down on the ground and start break dancing, which. <laughs> So just a humanizing moment, I hope, that uh, shows that they are real people. People are often surprised when they see images like that. Like they're laughing and they're smiling, um, despite the poverty and the hardship. Yeah, I mean, their lives are incredibly difficult. I cannot tell you how difficult it is to live in North Korea. Um, oh, here he is. I think he's, I, I call that break dancing. I'm not sure what he would call it. I call it a mean waiting to have. <laughs> One more. Oh, I don't, I don't know if this is the right video, but. <laughs> okay. Does anyone recognize this music? So what I love about this is they clearly, okay, A, that the Macarena has even gotten into North Korea. And B, they know there's a dance that goes with it, but they don't quite know how to do it. <laughs> like, so I told one of my friends to get up there and show them how it's done, because I frankly don't know how to do it either. But they can't Google it. They don't have access to the outside internet. They don't have access to our internet, so they can't Google it. So just a couple images to show you what... Uh... Wow, that's yeah. fantastic. So, to talk a little bit about... And, uh, so for me, it's very important to uh, try to humanize them we do all the very critical reporting, absolutely essential as well. I did a lot of reporting about the nuclear program. I do write a lot of commentary right now to try to put what we're seeing, all these developments on North Korea into perspective, provide context, provide the background and the history. Uh, but one thing that we are missing without access on the ground is understanding who they are as people. Uh, and, and despite the fact that I did open that bureau in North Korea, I think it, we're still challenged in trying to get access and trying to get the kind of access that would help us understand who they are, what they want, how to deal with them. And until we crack that, um, the diplomats who are representing both the United States and the South Koreans, the Chinese and, and other countries in the region are going to have a hard time negotiating with them. Um, to the question of what it, of, of the role of gender in working in a place like North Korea. Now, as a, as a woman, and particularly as an Asian woman, I have certainly had my share of Me Too moments, some pretty gruesome ones that I've never shared publicly, and I, I do suffer from some guilt for not having confronted them early on in my career. Uh, and I, I do talk about this privately with some of my colleagues because I have some regret that I didn't uh, confront them early on and perhaps allowed women who, women who followed in my footsteps to undergo the same thing. Some pretty egregious examples of um, sexual intimidation uh, that was carried out by both my colleagues and my supervisors when I was much younger. But I did recognize back then that to become a journalist meant to be tough, and so my way of coping with that was to be tough and try to look past that. Um, it is something that I, I have a bit of guilt about now and, and hope to, to share and discuss a bit because uh, I do think that's the reality of what it means to be a woman in this field. Now. Uh, one thing I found as an, as an Asian woman is that I tend to look, I feel old, but I tend to look younger than my age and that has affected the way people treat me. And one thing I've learned in the process is that it doesn't help me to be macho. I am not a man. I have to face the fact that I am a woman and what I've, what I've done in my career is try to use that to my advantage. One thing I learned early on is that perhaps because I'm a woman, people are much more comfortable speaking to me than they might be to a man. And that's just a tool that I've learned to use to my advantage. And I try to tell young women as well that we, there's no way around the fact that we're women. We have to find a way to use that to our advantage and to not to try to compete with men, 
but to come to the table with our own attributes, our own skills, and embrace and accept the fact that we are different. Uh, I cannot compete with men the same with the same set of skills. I've got a different set of skills, and I'm going to bring those to the table. And that's absolutely why it's important to have diversity, whether it's diversity of gender, sexual orientation, a race, because we do all have different skills that we bring to the table. And we can tell stories from a different angle based on our perspective, our difference of our perspective, and different access that we have because of that perspective. I am absolutely convinced that I was able to open that bureau in North Korea because I am who I am. Part of it, part of it is because the North Koreans looked across the table and saw someone that they thought that they could work with. And so it was very smart on the, on the part of the AP president to put me in that position. He knew that I would be able to play a certain role and, and it turns out a, a groundbreaking role. So this is something that I'm absolutely proud of. Um, I wanted to get to the issue of, you were talking about distance or the gulf in your photography or in photography in general. And that is something that I think I see in the photography by women photojournalists in North Korea versus male photojournalists. It's an observation I've noticed. Um, is that some of the women shooting in North Korea are able to get closer to their subjects in a way than the men, that the men haven't been. And so that's something to pay attention to as well, that there is a difference in what we're getting on the ground based on our gender as well. I think I'm going to leave it there because I think I've gone well beyond. I'm stalling a little bit because I keep hoping that no, Cassie sorry. will turn up and run in. <laughs> but I'm sure you have a lot of questions for all the panelists, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, As we've been hoping, Cassie might walk in that door, which is not going to happen, but you'll hopefully have a chance to meet her at some other point um, uh, uh, during the conference. I just wanted to give a nod to, to uh, uh, her work and also um, tell you very briefly about the work of Deuce Namwezi, who, who wasn't able to join us. Cassie's done a lot of incredible work from um, conflict zones across um, Africa. Um, she was also with the AP in Kabul for years. She's been all over the place, and she is she's as tough a journalist as they come. Um, but if you have a whole bunch of gender bias in your head, pretty easy to underestimate because she's also beautiful, petite, and sweet. So look out, warlords. Um, she did a piece about a female uh, rebel group or, or a brigade of a, fe a female brigade in a rebel group in the Central African Republic. Um, that, and I just want to read the lead of it to you because for me it kind of encapsulates one of the things that's very different about having women have the idea to do this coverage. A man could have done this story, absolutely. As a man, you could go in and talk to female rebels in the Central African Republic. It's, it, that would work. But it wouldn't have sounded like this. Here's the opening. Melvia wants to make something very clear. She joined the rebels to kill, not to boil manioc or perform other chores that are usually dumped on women. She wanted to fight back against the men who attacked her village in the Central African Republic, torched her home, killed her grandmother. I didn't join the group to cook, she says. I wanted to do the hard work. Oh, hi. There she is. <laughs> wow. Well, if I'd known reading your words was all it would take to summon you, I'd have done it an hour ago. Um, and I, I just I thought that that was just an incredible uh, uh, way of getting at gender and these issues. Yes, You're hello. Three minutes early. Yeah, don't hug me. I'm just. Um, I'm gonna give you a hug. No, 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 no. Welcome. As you sit, I'm gonna tell you guys also briefly about Deuce Namwezi. Deuce is a Congolese radio producer, now the director of a station called Mama Radio. And the origin story and trajectory of Mama Radio, I think, is in a lot of ways similar to like the trajectory of women in foreign correspondence and like women's issues, quote unquote, in international news. So um, Deuce was mentored by another female radio journalist called Shushu Namagabe, and Shushu was the only female reporter and producer at a station in South Kivu, in Bukavu, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You may know Bukavu um, as named by a UN senior official, the rape capital of the world. Not a name that a Congolese person would have come up with, but we'll move on. Um, and when, when that happened, Shushu was reporting and said, okay, so this is all that anyone's talking about in the international press. It's all that the women around me are talking about, but it's not on the radio, why not? And there was one female editor at the station who said, all right, if you can find a way to do it, then do those stories, bring them on the air. So they put stories about women being raped on the air in Congolese radio, and as you might imagine, the Congolese like freaked out. 
Um, men said, this is a shame for women. Why would you want to publicize this? How dare you speak about this publicly? It forced a communal conversation um, that, that hadn't been had. She turned that into a weekly radio program, bringing women's voices on the air about different issues. Um, and now Deuce, who's kind of inherited the organization now that Shushu has moved on, turned that weekly radio program into a daily news station. So they run 16 hours of programming a day on all kinds of different topics, but there is one cardinal rule that is still kind of hard for some of her new reporters to learn. No story goes on the air unless there's a female voice in the story. Doesn't matter what it's about. So if you're talking about inflation in the marketplace, you better be talking to a woman and not just because she's the sad person who can't sell her beans. And I think, well, if you can do that in Eastern Congo with no resources and a huge patriarchal power structure against you, the rest of us sure as hell can be doing a lot better. So go to Congo and meet Deuce. That's my recommendation. I think officially we have like maybe 15 minutes for questions. Unofficially, no one's in this room until two. So um, does anyone want to, I would love to turn it over to you guys um, and see if you have questions. And then maybe we can also integrate Cassie into the Q&A part of the thing. Is that all right? Yeah. yeah great. OK. Of course. Go for it, sir. You're crazy. Did you miss your flight? That's some heroic driving woman. Well done. Hi, I'm from Russia. I'm an independent journalist. And I think that it's a great topic to discuss. And uh, my question is a little bit out of the area of the topic, but it's still concerning the role of women. Um, as, uh, despite the fact that I am a man, I still stand up for the idea that women has a great role. And... Uh, journalism, international journalism, and sometimes women dare to do things that men maybe would never ever do, dare to do. I mean, uh, visiting hotspots, uh, telling people the truth by their reportages, etc. And uh, I know that sometimes, or maybe a, a lot of times, women uh, brave women are being cruelly persecuted for the things they do in many countries. And, uh, for example, in Russia, we know that if you know Politkovskaya, journalist Politkovskaya, she told the truth. And uh, a lot of, a lot of family, um, family names, like uh, Svetlana Ladrus is now persecuted cruelly for the documentary projects. And I have just one question. How can we, the society, or maybe other ways, can we protect such hero women in this world for the things they do, dare to do? Thank you. Maybe we can take a couple of questions at once? Yeah. Thank you. Hello? My name is Magda Abu Fadl. I'm a former correspondent and editor with AFP and UPI. And then I moved to academia, and uh, now I train journalists, and I've helped produce a semester-long university course on safety for journalists for the Arab world, Middle East, and North Africa. And I'd like to ask all of you, um, if any of you have suffered from PTSD, and how different that is from your male colleagues and any of the um, pressures that you've suffered from maybe psychologically and physically and uh, how you've overcome that in terms of um, what, what you can give to other journalists, young up and coming journalists and how they can deal with that problem. Maybe one more, we'll take in groups of threes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vincenzia Fuko. I'm from Tanzania, and I work for Tanzania Media Foundation. I'm a uh, media development expert, and one of the programs that I do is to um, design programs for journalists so that they can report stories that will trigger accountability in Tanzania. But one of the challenges that I face is to getting women into reporting you know, sensitive stories or being investigative journalists or doing stories that would uh, bring you know, change. They like covering um, 
I may say simple stories, but even getting them to participate in the program sometimes is, is not easy. But listening to, you know, I call it powerhouse, you know, they, they covering the stories, and I'm a mother myself, so listening to Anna, for instance, or uh, in North, North, North Korea, it's, it's not easy. Um, I would really like to know how, um, what are the possible opportunities that maybe we can discuss even later on how I can support these women to cover, you know, stories, because I know how powerful women's stories are. But if they're not nurtured, if they're not mentored, it's not easy to get these women to talk these stories. So I would really like to know from um, you um, whether there are opportunities for mentorship or if we can discuss about partnerships on how um, I can support these women in Tanzania. Thank you. All right, so let's take these three at once. Um, I'm going to maybe re-encapsulate as well. Please bear with me to so, sort of open some of these up to, to the widest possible conversation. Maybe we can interpret the first question is a question about um, being safe on the job. Um, I'm going to confess I have, I'm having a little tiny, tiny bit of a feminist, I don't need your protection moment going on. Yeah. So let's, let's open that up as a safety question, if that's all right. And then we can talk about PTSD and, and psychological safety in a way, actually there's a good theme there. Um, and then we can talk about mentorship connections and bringing women into to workspaces where um, it's, they're not gonna get there on their own without some help and what could that look like strategically. You wanna kick us off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm with Gina a little bit on the idea of protection of these hero women um, also the word hero and heroic. And actually it gives me a nice segue into this book by Svetlana Alexevich, The Unwomanly Face of War, um, which is about the testimonies of Russian female soldiers in the Second World War as tank commanders, snipers, infantry people. They were doing all of it. This book was censored uh, in 1984, heavily censored, and was re-released in Oh, last year, 2017, with all the full testimonies. And I had a little bit in here to read out because I thought it was quite enlightening. So I think it's not really about how do we protect these women. Um, I wrote some points down immediately, like question power, first of all. Like who has the power of making these decisions? Who is it that's in those positions? And actually can they, um, rather than feel like sidelining women's voices um, around... Um, talking or speaking out or calling out culture, we have to change the narrative around when women speak up because there's really negative words associated to women who speak up. Bossy, right? Outspoken. Why is it outspoken? To say what you think. And also the last thing I'm going to put is patriarchy. Um, patriarchy is about looking in the mirror, questioning how the system of patriarchy has given you a certain sense of privilege that perhaps a woman doesn't have and how we change that a little bit. People talk about toxic masculinity, um, and I think actually a lot of the work has to be done by men as well, not just like questioning, how can I protect a woman? Well, okay, but who am I as a man in this space? Like, what can I actually do with other men to dismantle these power structures so that women don't need any protection from anything, right? That's a bigger picture aspiration. Rather ideological, but, you know, and then, you know, as a woman, learn a little bit of self-defense, learn where to punch people. Just not practical. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. May I, uh, it occurs to me as you, as you say that, actually, Ali, that um, so I work in, in, in East Africa, and well, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, there's a lot of conversation in the development space about a principle called do no harm, and there's supposed to be a lot of self-reflection by uh, development workers about well-intentioned intervention. It's an idea of checking your intentions against the actual work that you're doing in the world. And hopefully, if you're open enough and reflective enough, making sure that you protect yourself against actually creating a problematic or harmful or negative scenario for the people you're trying to help, yeah. but missing that completely, excuse me, missing that completely because you're so preoccupied by how nice it was of you to think of it in the first place, right? Yeah. So checking your yeah. intentions against your consequences. And I think that maybe we, you know, if one can make a call to all the men on the planet, it might be ask yourself if in whatever space you're in, especially professionally, are you doing no harm? 
right? As at least as a first principle, and then you know, secondarily, how can I be a good ally? And I think there are a lot of women who are willing to talk to men about how to be good allies. Um, but keep in mind that that is a form of unpaid labor as well. Uh, and pay us a day rate. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, maybe psycho we could talk also about psychological safety and, and PTSD in, in, in work. Can I just add one? Yeah. Sorry, I just got here and I'm already. Yes. Um, in terms of your question, I think to cut a bit of slack, and I hear what you guys are saying too, the cases you mentioned are about press freedom and attacks on the press. So it's not about protecting hero women or anything like that, but it is about addressing issues around press freedom and danger for journalists. So yes, some of those names, the cases you cited, are really widely known because of the work they were doing, the country they were doing it in. But there are a lot of other people who are detained, who are targeted. There's a big story out this week about a female colleague of ours. So it's about press freedom, plain and simple. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that space. Yeah. But may I add something? Uh, how maybe do we have any concrete ways to protect such journalists who are in trouble now? Maybe organizations, some who can protect them, their rights. Because I, I know that there are lots of countries that are not you know, welcoming such talks inside the country. I mean, I think probably. I mean, for sure, I can think of a few. You can probably think of a few. I'm going to invite us to have that conversation offline, if that's all right. But please do follow up. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, questions on the table about mentoring and about um, PTSD as a shorthand for trauma. Sorry, Bruce. I can talk a little bit about PTSD. So I worked in a country where there wasn't a lot of physical danger, perhaps, but the psychological uh, pressure of being monitored under surveillance, that wasn't something I was expecting. It is amazing what it does to your psychological state, it's almost, I kind of compare it to, it almost feels like you have the flu the whole time you're there. You know how when you have the flu, you're just like, you're, you're impatient, you're not yourself? That's what it feels like to work in North Korea all the time. And um, I, I think that I wasn't prepared for that. It took me two years to recover from before, it took me two years before I could sit through a meal without feeling like I was gonna, I had to get up and run run out the door because I felt claustrophobic. And so I think that that's something that needs to be recognized when you work in repressive regimes, is that there is that psychological component. And so that's something that I try to draw attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, I obviously, I come from a, a military background, as some of you know, um, and PTSD is a term that became really prevalent after the war in Iraq. Um, it's post-traumatic stress disorder, which actually reinforces what I'm about to say. Um, you need to understand what PTSD is. Um, and also, it's a very uh, well-used term now, but there are actually like symptoms associated to it. Um, and I think in, often in many cases, people will have an anxiety disorder or depression or a combination of those that may not actually be PTSD. So I think the first port of call is actually to understand what that term means, because actually what we don't want to do is um, become less resilient to what we're doing because we've been labelled with something that actually we haven't had diagnosed. So I think getting professional psychological support um, regularly um, and not because you're having a breakdown, as in like part of your work process. So building emotional resilience isn't about waiting until excuse my language, the shit hits the fan, you feel like everything's falling apart and then you get a diagnosis. I actually think counselling in this line of work is something that you should regularly do and check in with people when you've interviewed somebody who's had experiences of trauma as well because you're the kind of pot that they're going through to talk about their stories and you should be as clean as you can be, like when you're doing your cooking, which I do very badly. Um, <laughs> So I think that's, it should be built into the workflow. I think asking people if they've had any experiences with PTSD could be quite triggering and perhaps something that we wouldn't want to share openly as well. I think there's always something we need to be mindful of as well because it's something that we do in journalism, right? We get people to talk about the worst thing that ever happened to them. So we need counselling support alongside for that too, right? Yeah, but, but as a woman, protecting your male colleagues who may have or suffered... I... Yeah. 
Sure, sure. I think um, the only way that for me, and I'm talking from my perspective here, right, not from, I'm not speaking for everybody, um, my experience of getting support for symptoms likely to be PTSD, which is something I did a few years ago after a trip, um, was that I didn't feel I could access it because the representation of PTSD was very much male orientated. And that's still the case, especially in the military veteran community. Um, and often this terrible label of, well, you're a woman, you're emotional. You know, it's like that gets put your way quite a lot. So a call to all women who experience these psychological symptoms is to be open about it, but then don't become the poster girl for PTSD. Right, it's a, it's a, ba it's a balance, really, because you don't want to keep traumatizing yourself. Yeah. And one thing, just exactly what you said, because PTSD is so specific. Mm -hmm. I think that one thing that we started to see a lot of when I was still in my newsroom, because I only went freelance like a year and a half ago, um, with the internet, with certain terrorist groups and imagery that's going around, there are a lot more people who are exposed to traumatic imagery, mm -hmm. and they won't present nine times out of 10 typical PTSD symptoms. So we had to become aware and really talk to our teams about, you know, you need to be aware of how your body is reacting. And if you need the people around you to say if something seems a little off. Because you might not have PTSD, but you've definitely gone through something, even if it's just looking through. And not even, I don't want to diminish the horrors of looking at ISIS imagery. But so we had to have a lot of conversations with our staff about recognizing, self-recognizing what was going on. Mm -hmm. And in terms of male colleagues and, and being different, I think the only thing that I think could kind of speak to that is, um, like I know how my body reacts in uh, intense situations. So one thing I've had to do is when shit has hit the fan, I felt the need to kind of explain to my male colleagues what was going to happen. Because my blood pressure drops, I get weirdly calm, my voice gets really calm and it's mm -hmm. very zen. And I know that normally about 30 to 40 minutes afterwards, I'll start to shake and cry. And so I've had to, I mean, tell me, I'll call it, okay, I'm fine, we're alive, it's okay. Just gonna tell you, I will probably start crying in a little bit. It's just natural, it's what happens to me. And if I need anything further down the line, those are resources that I will seek out. And that one last sense. tiny bit. I met um, uh, a woman called Patrice Colors Khan recently, who's the co-founder of Black Lives Matter. And she said, as a society, we've become obsessed with self-care. She said, but if you're doing difficult work, it's about collective care and how we actually are better allies together. So looking at peer, group, um, peer groups and support, similar to what Cassie's saying, those little closed Facebook groups, you can get a lot of stuff solved just reaching out to each other. It's a very individualistic community sometimes in journalism, but when you're out together on reporting on something, that'll be where you make your best mates, right? So that kind of collective care is really important in that sphere as well. We're being sure, cut yeah. off so we're being by the men in the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ironic. We can, we can continue this conversation outside. We'll find each other and have drinks. I'm so sorry we didn't get to, to mentorship and, and networks, but don't, don't go anywhere. I, I want to talk to yeah, you. Yeah, the woman from Tanzania, Thank you guys don't so leave much the room, for, please. Thank you for coming. We speak to you. Sorry I was late. <laughs>